This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. committee agendas page. So I know this is a meeting of the Amherst School Committee, but it is posted there. Um, so if I will display, but um, you're welcome to go to our website to find it there as well. Um, okay. Can folks see this? Yes. Okay. Thank you.
I'm going to scroll more quickly through this one because this um, community member has also submitted um, a, a verbal uh, voice message comment. So um, as a reminder, this is in the, the document that's posted online. And as mentioned, we have two um, voice comments. Amherst Mass, my daughter's a first grader at Fort River School. I'm calling once again to express my frustration at the lack of progress of getting our kids back in schools. Uh, it seems like every day there's a new article showing that uh, transmission rates in schools are not causes of transmission in towns that there's much uh, more important factors, that schools are safe and can be reopened, and that it's an incredibly high priority to keep schools open to benefit children, especially those who need it most. Um, it seems like there's no progress uh, right now in um, considering metrics in our town that are based on science and are flexible and prioritize the learning of the children. Um, and I just can't understand uh, why there's been no movement as we've learned more and more. Um, we need to get the kids back in school as soon as humanly possible, and I hope that the town can come to some agreement to do that. Thank you. Bye. My name is Stephanie Hockman, and I'm a resident of Pell, Massachusetts. I'm submitting the following for public comment for tonight's school committee meeting, December 1st, 2020. And specifically, I'm directing my comments to the teachers, the APA executive members, and the administrators. I'm imploring all teachers to speak to their APEA representatives, encourage the APA to use common sense, concern for the education of our students, and return to the negotiation table. The current MOU was negotiated at a time when little was known about the transmission of COVID. So much more is known today, and we know how to handle the opening of schools safely, just as we've learned to open bars, restaurants, grocery stores, and gyms safely. I've spoken to many teachers in the middle and high school, all of whom want to be back teaching in the classroom. However, these teachers fear, fear retribution if they speak up against the small number of loud voices in the EPA, APEA. That is wrong. No one voice within a union should make decisions for a larger body that do not represent the majority of that union. When the MOU was agreed to, it was prior to all the knowledge we now have on the transmission of COVID. The nation's foremost experts in infectious disease understand the science, and many schools across the nation, which are open to in-person learning, have given us knowledge and evidence that COVID transmission rates are not higher in schools than in the broader community. Furthermore, in some locations, in-person education and having students and teachers in schools are shown to be safer than the rates in the broader community. Teachers who are currently advocating to stay more remote or more disappointingly, those that are staying silent for fear of rocking the boat with the APA, I encourage you to think long-term about why you're educators and what you want for your students. The remote learning is not providing the same level of rigor nor the same level of education our students deserve. In addition, the anxiety and isolation being forced on my teams to do remote learning is causing detrimental harm. Like the 82 respondents in the exit survey, if the school committee, the superintendent, the APEA, and the teachers can't get back to in-person learning this spring, our family, like many others I know, will seek one of two remedies. The first will be to move our students to school districts that value in-person education, understand science, respect a fluid evidence-based approach, and most importantly, are willing to put education students first. The APA continues to dig in their heels and refuse to renegotiate terms. They will be the downfall of this system and more and more families, especially those with means, will seek other educational institutions, resulting in severe budget cuts and the potential loss of teachers and staff jobs. A second course of action by many families may be to file a lawsuit against the district for not providing the free and appropriate education our students have a right to receive. Dr. Morris, school committee, I encourage you to take a stand. If the APEA won't come to the table, require the teachers to come back to the classroom. Okay, um, so uh, our next item of business is, um, and our only item of business is the MSBA update. Um, and I'm going to look to 
either Mr. Harrington or Dr. Morris to kick us off there. Well, Mr. Harrington beat me to it, so I'll, uh, I guess it's on me, but uh, I'll turn to him later. Um, fair, well done, by the way. Um, so um, I actually want to take a step back and just, um, I think probably most people um, on this group uh, followed the prior project and have a good history of where we are, but I'd actually, you know, forgive me uh, or offer me patience to just spend probably two or three minutes going backwards before we go forward so that um, I think it, it might be helpful for the audience uh, in general. So um, in 2013, we were accepted into the MSBA process. Uh, you know, that, that process went to the place that was approved by the MSBA for funding. Um, voters approved an override and then it failed at town meetings. So that project ended. There was the tail end has more twists and turns, but I don't think they're super relevant for this conversation um, today. And so, you know, that project ended in 2017. And, uh, you know, it, we, you know, the district and the town reapplied. Uh, we were, uh, we did not get in the first time we reapplied. And then we reapplied again and we were accepted into their, uh, into their pipeline. Um, since that time, which we were accepted in, uh, which is a year ago-ish, um, right, you know, it's kind of become cliche to say it feels more than a year ago, but it, it, it was in that ballpark. Uh, we had the first part of our um, study, which is, um, you know, the town has now appropriated and need to, they needed to amend it, but they have uh, $750,000, uh, which will have uh, hopefully some reimbursement uh, from MSBA to fund the feasibility study. Because uh, we're still we're in um, an enrollment and um, kind of that initial phase, uh, we formed uh, the town has formed a school building committee of which Mr. Harrington was uh, appointed here by as the representative of the school committee, uh, and that group's met uh, twice now. I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Harrington for confirmation. Meeting again next week. Um, the, for people to know, those are public meetings that do have public comment. So if people want to follow along, they they certainly can. At the last meeting, um, Councillor Shane was uh, appointed and voted in as the chair of the committee, and Councillor Schreiber, Town Councillor Schreiber, was voted as the vice chair of the committee. And you know, because I have experience in those roles, I offered you know my support to them and whatever would be helpful. Uh, along the way, there's been multiple steps. Um, you know, uh, Rupert Roy Clark, our facilities director, had submit a maintenance report. Um, you know, I had to submit a bunch of documents for enrollment. And right now where we are is waiting for enrollment information to come back from them. So, um, what we, you know, what they do is they look at what we've proposed, uh, their own enrollment study, and they will propose uh, a certain number of enrollments for us to study. For instance, you know, one thing that's not a surprise is that uh, one of the enrollments we'll study is keeping everything status quo and looking to renovate or re uh, rebuild Fort River uh, in the size that it would be projected to be in five years. Um, that will almost certainly be one of the options that will be studied, and I think just about every project, that's an option that gets studied. Then there are a number of other options that we've discussed with MSBA um, and waiting for their official confirmation and letter of what they will approve us to study. Um, that's sort of the tail end of the process of the enrollment where we are. Uh, after that, we can uh, move forward with hiring an owner project manager, and then they'll guide us through uh, the rest of the process from there. So. We're at the tail end of this this phase. We do need approval from the MSBA to be accepted into the feasibility stage, um, but I think we're nearing our conclusion in terms of you know checking off all the. Our checklist is getting down to the bottom, uh, and we've submitted everything we need to submit. And really, at this point, only thing we're waiting to hear back is enrollments. I think it is worth noting that um, I'll give a, an example. For instance. Um, you know, one of the things that, that certainly there's a public meeting with a posted agenda for Pelham School Committee on Thursday night uh, where, you know, regionalization with Amherst is at least on their agenda to discuss, not at all to propose, not at all to do anything with. Uh, and I did, you know, talk to MSBA a bit about um, that, like what would happen if, and they were really clear that they're looking for districts who are ready to move. Uh, and for us to talk about regionalization as a hypothetical at this point is not something that will be supported. And if that's something that this committee wanted to take on and that would affect the enrollment, they would encourage us to drop out of the MSBA process and reapply when we have confirmation that that's something we want to do. Um, they are willing to, you know, engage us. We've talked a lot about, you know, sixth grade to the middle school. It comes as no surprise that, you know, some options, we had a very public process 
year and a half ago uh, to, to talk about what options might be, uh, and then a very public study around sixth grade to the middle school. And, and grade reconfiguration is something that they could, uh, they would consider for us uh, as an option and that would affect enrollment. I think it's important to note that not that any decisions have been made, but they feel like that's something that's fully in the auspices of the school committee uh, can occur in our case without any funding shifts, um, you know, or, or investments, I should say. Um, but when it comes to something big, like, you know, becoming an elementary region, um, they're looking for districts who have sort of made that decision, uh, not districts who are, have studied it and, and it's not really an active discussion at the moment. Um, and they're just very clear, you know, if for districts who aren't ready to move, they're just, they're not interested in working with them at that time. They're happy to have people drop out and reapply. And they, and they talked about some districts who have opted to do that. They just, they weren't ready to move forward. Um, and so we're looking forward to getting their enrollment letter and bringing that to the, hopefully we get it in time for the next uh, building committee meeting, but it's not in, in our control um, when that letter goes out. And we'll sort of go from there, but I'm sure I'm missing things. So I'll ask Mr. Harrington to, to fill in the gaps of what I've missed. Well, I, I feel like you, you uh, actually added more than I would have. So <laughs> that, that, that's a solid update for now. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ben. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, that anyone on the committee has. No questions. Mr. Demling. So, um, okay, so with the regionalization update that they gave you verbally, they, is that something they're gonna make clearer in the, in the formal letter that, they, that they, they give us for the enrollment options that they would approve us to study? And, and, um, and, and, when, and about when should we, do we expect that letter? Um, this month, for sure. Um, uh, easy to say that on the first of the month, but, but I, I feel confident saying that. Um, and to your first point, um, my experience with the MSBA is they'll be explicit and clear about what they're willing to do. Um, they tend to not go into great analysis of what they're not willing to do. Um, so uh, I, I, don't, I haven't seen, right, there's no drafted letter that's been uh, seen. I, I don't know exactly what it'll have in it, but verbally, you know, in conversations with the MSBA, uh, just raising this topic, um, they're very clear about that. But I think um, my experience is they're very directive of here's what we're willing to do, and they they don't often address what they're not willing to do. Um, but that 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 may you know that may be a style thing that may shift, right? I haven't been in we haven't been in this process. I haven't been connected to it for quite some time. Um, but that that's sort of my experience. Mr. Demley. So the, the proposal that, that we submitted we, way, way back now, <laughs> um, this compromise proposal, right, to get a building to take care of Fort River and Wildwood, approximately 600 students. Then we talked about different ways to get to 600, right? And so, so the reason why I asked about regionalization is because I'm not advocating for or against that here. I'm just thinking about the various ways that one gets to that 600. And so, okay, if that's, if, if, if they've given you direct guidance, it sounds like, that that's not an option, then that that simplifies the um, the uh, what what needs to be studied and looked at. Um, and then, so then you talked about that you 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 mentioned the sixth grade to the middle school, um, and th that's another option where, where the enrollment for the elementary shifts, obviously, and gets you to 600. So the other variable in that that's been discussed publicly is, is Crocker Farm, to some extent, playing some role. Um, in that enrollment picture of getting to 600, um, do you, ha, has that come up in discussion, or or do we expect that to be referenced in this this formal letter of options that will be approved to study? Yeah, so the, the it has come up in discussion. Um, I did share the full Crocker Farm expansion study with them for their consideration. Um, I did request that we look at enrollment, you know, potential enrollment that. Uh, would include that, and um, we'll wait and see what they say. Um, but um, you know, it was certainly communicated very clear to them that this there's um, some interest in the community. It got funded that project to to look at Crocker Farm expansion. Um, you know, we looked at their numbers, um, which are always going to be a little different than how we calculate them because that's just the nature of this. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to how they respond to to that scenario. Ms. Spitzer? 
thanks for the update. Um, I guess just two quick things, and I think you've answered this before, but I want to just say it um, again on the record since this is the topic. For the MSBA, the enrollment numbers are not going, I mean, I was just listening to NPR. We had another story about declining enrollment that's being seen in our district and across the state. So will the COVID decline in enrollment, it's not going to be impacting these enrollment numbers that are going to be shared from the MSBA, I'm hoping. And, I, and then I just have one other follow-up question, which was thinking about how we're going to just get people to tune back in, I guess, to the MSBA process and what are the thoughts? I, I know we had a website, I'm actually on arps.org right now trying to track down where it is, but, and I know these meetings are public. I'm just thinking if we could if, if share again, the website that folks can go to to get updates on the process and also maybe start sharing this a little bit on our social media chain, channels or otherwise, I just think it's important that we make sure the public's tuning in again to this process as um, I think it's really important. Um, so, um, I guess a couple things, um, in terms of, um, let me just slow down a little bit because there was a couple things in there. So, um, in terms of communication, that's certainly something that the building committee is, wants to take on. And we've had some internal conversations to where the website should sit on the town site or the school site and all that. So we got to sort that out. And now that we have a chair. Uh, and some clear leadership. I think that'll be, you know, something that we want to do in the in the short term. You know, in terms of COVID, you know, they, I think they were using historical data that didn't include. It. Desi just updated the website last week, I believe, with the um, the current year's data, which shows the significant drop. All this work was done prior to that data being public. Um, so um, I do not think they took that into account. All the data that I've seen from them did not take that into account. I think the thing to note is the MSBA generally is going to be tighter on space than what AMR standards are, you know, in terms of, you know, when we, we've had many conversations, including recently about, well, you know, I know you're going to bank on 25 students per class. That's not consistent with the school committee guidelines. And so we try to work with them on that. Um, but I don't think the COVID uh, enrollment decline is, is going to factor into their plans. I have no evidence of that. And all the, all the work was done prior to uh, the updates to in the enrollment. Is there one more? I feel like you asked one more that I didn't get to. No, that was just it. Um, communication okay. and the enrollment numbers and COVID. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, Mr. Demling and Mr. Spitzer asked my question, so I don't have anything to ask. <laughs> Um, maybe I could just add that, you know, on our website under initiatives is, uh, you know, the, the current school building committee website, which we're, again, we're going to decide what we want to do with. Um, but it, it is on there, you know, at least as a template for now, it does have the members of the school building committee. Um, it has some of the documents um, that, that have been completed, but it's, it's not, you know, that there's not that much there and there's not that much to be there yet. Um, but once we get an OPM on board, my experience is things pick up very rapidly. So we want to make sure we have that kind of plan attended to very quickly. And I, you know, for what it's worth, I'll say publicly, I'm glad we have um, town councilors really involved in, in this. Um, I think it, it's, you know, one of my major learnings from the last project is, yes, it's a school building project and there's no disrespect to anyone, any of the elected officials here tonight. But it, but it has townwide ramifications. And so I'm really pleased that we have counselors who are willing to be involved and then in leadership positions on that, because I think it doesn't absolve the schools of doing communication at all, but I think it really helps with a townwide focus as opposed to a school-specific uh, focus. I want to thank um, Kathy and Steve for jumping in and being willing to lead. Great. Any other comments? Or Questions? Seeing none. Um, and we have a, a three minute pause until our colleagues from the regional school committee join us. So um, if folks can make sure that you're back on screen at 630, that'd be great.
Welcome, Mr. Sullivan. Um, oh, Ms. Seeger is saying she doesn't have the invite. I'll email it to her. If you open up, I didn't have it either, but if you open up the email and the, the calendar will pop open and then you can, it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's on the calendar invite, as Steve said. Okay. Um, well, we can um, at least call ourselves to order, um, and she'll likely be joining us momentarily. Um, so seeing a presence of, of a quorum of the uh, Regional School Committee, I'm calling that meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. on Tuesday, December 1st. And we'll take a roll call attendance. Please state, your, uh, state present when I call your name. Mr. Demling? Demling present. Mr. Harrington? Harrington present. Ms. Kenny? Oh, sorry, she's not here. Um, Ms. Lord? Lord present. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan present. And McDonald present. Um, and um, Ms. Seeger, are you present? <laughs> yes, Seeger present. And Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Excellent. Um, and uh, on the uh, in the meeting, we also have our student representative, um, Ms. Uh, Emily Gribko, um, and we also have uh, Ciela Sharkis. Um, uh, taking minutes for us and Dr. Morris. So we'll begin with um, the superintendent's update. Dr. Morris. Sure. Um, it's a lengthier one, um, but I'll start by just um, sadly uh, and understandably the Kanagasaki um, group confirmed that they're not coming this spring, which, you know, again, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. And it's such a wonderful partnership that it's it's sad not to be able to continue uh, the in-person part of that, which which is always, you know, for the students, uh, both their students and our students, the highlight of the experience. So just want to thank our, our partners in Kanagasaki that, you know, hopefully we're in a, a really different place uh, in 2020, you know, I guess it would be the, the spring of 2022. Uh, typically those those visits happen in the spring, uh, but appreciate the close communication, collaboration, and and more than anything, friendship that we maintain with the, our um you know, our counterparts on the other side of the world. Um, but, you know, appreciate that with them. Um, I also want to, and you, some of you may have seen this on social media, but we had an anonymous uh, chalk artist come to our schools and, and give them wonderfully kind messages to students, faculty, staff, um, and it was incredibly appreciated. So just want to share that and also want to share my appreciation. You know, we heard a lot of public comment earlier uh, at the Amherst meeting, um, and I think understandably so, about, uh, metrics and return to school uh, and all those things. And, and I just want to note um, all those things can be, you know, I want to honor those. And I also want to thank the staff for trying to make the best of a very, very difficult situation. So uh, I think, you know, 
if we're not in living in a time of dualities uh, that you know where statements can both be true and not counteract each other, I think this is it. So I, I want to you know acknowledge how uh, how difficult it was to hear the, those public comments that were shared or to listen slash read them. But uh, but I also want to acknowledge that staff um, are really trying to make the best of the situation and um, thought I'd share that. And really appreciate whoever that anonymous artist was. <laughs> Uh, thank you for doing that. It brightened a lot of people's days, um, mine included, because some of them is outside uh, near where, where I work. Um, at the Distance Learning Center uh, at the high school for intensive needs students, uh, we are up to 13 students who are attending. Um, and, you know, thank you to everybody involved in making that a reality, you know, starting with facilities, Fay Brady, special ed folks. Um, and just, you know, one of the nice things um, has been just hearing uh, both directly by email, but also through Faye and others, just uh, Chris Cusack, uh, who's kind of the one of the administrators on site, just how, how much difference it's making for kids and families. Um, you know, we were concerned about, you know, not every student is a high school student who's in this. This is a K-12 program. Uh, and yet um, kids have adjusted very well, uh, been very supported and we're hearing really positive feedback. So thanks to everyone involved in that. Um, I got a couple questions uh, multiple times from people about it after the last school committee meeting. So I thought I'd use this uh, as an opportunity just to clarify things. Uh, none of the students are required to come in. This was a, this was a, something we, we made available to families of K-12 intensive needs students um, that, that opted to do it. And uh, that's a question I got. Uh, another one was, you know, how expensive this is, and the short story is, you know, this is additional cost. We are looking at grant funding to offset um, some of these costs, but for many of these students, um, in terms of needing access to in-person support, this is going to be a very cost-effective strategy compared to the other one, which is not a district placement, um, which may, we're starting to get multiple families requesting uh, the exploration of. And so, you know, for us, it's it's we think it's in the best interest of those students to help them fully access a distance learning curriculum. But we also think, while well, it's an additional cost, um, it's much less than the cost of out of district placement and keep students in their home district, which we have a long-standing value in. Uh, we are working with LSSC and the Marks Meadow Aftercare programs. Those are not uh, being run by um, us. Uh, they're run by our partners, uh, but they're collaborating with us. We got a, a really nice email from a principal uh, that I shared with, with the chair this morning, um, just talking about um, students who are really struggling going back to our last meeting with attendance. Um, two students who had a, a total of over 50 absences to date, and since they've become part of the aftercare program or the daycare program, uh, their attendance has been spotless, uh, and they're being much more successful in the school setting. So really appreciate Marks Meadow and LSC and their work and working with them to see if they can get the approval from the state to expand uh, the number of slots available, which would uh, expand access to, to folks in our community. Um, I'll... I have a bunch more to say on the update. Sorry, I have a long update. You know, you give me a week without a meeting, I come back with long update, I apologize. But um, I wanted to pause if there were questions about either Kanagasaki, uh, the Distance Learning Center, or um, the anonymous artist. I don't think there'll be questions about it, but it was pretty cool if you saw it. Uh, Mr. Denling. Yeah, so I, I, I want to really appreciate the, you know the effort that you and and the administrators have gone through to establish this for our intensive special needs students. Um, you know, one of the hardest things for me through this entire process has has been, um, you know, uh, hearing these stories directly from parents um, at the CPAC meetings and hearing public comment for months about how these students are struggling and really really needed in-person uh, assistance in order to, to gain access to education. And so the fact that we're able to do this for even a small number of students, I think is um, very, um, very noteworthy given the, given the circumstances. So um, I just wanted to take a moment to, to acknowledge that. And, and, and getting the, the email that you shared with us from the principal about the, uh, the improvement in attendance for our students who are having attendance issues, um, now going to the distance learning centers um, was was also great to see. And so I'm I'm just trying to think, you know, how, what other limitations do we have to expanding this to more students, right? Because yeah, I mean, I understand that there are a, a, a smaller number of students who, if we we're, weren't able to service them, would be looking at out of district. But you know. There's that next level up, right, of students who might not be as intensive special needs, but there's still significant special needs. 
and are are really struggling in remote learning you know um in addition to you know to, to our other students and we want to meet every student's having a t attendance issue it would be ideally right to be able to offer this service so um you know the high school is a big place we have a, a lot of we have a lot of rooms um i mean you know i mean i'm i'm, I'm half joking but not, not really you know we spent a long time lo looking not just the high school but all of our buildings and really making sure that they were completely ready and you know ab above the grade uh in terms of air exchange and whatnot so um it doesn't seem like physical space is, a, is an issue so what, like go when, uh, when we look at the following weeks and months you know what's 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 will be our limiting capacity in order to expand this as much as possible sure so in terms of mark's motto and lssc i mean they have to get the staffing in place space as you know is not an issue uh, really all we're offering and it's not all but it's what we're offering is in-kind space, you know, um, and then we are providing some transportation for families who can't provide it um, or would struggle to provide it as well. That's a pretty small number of students. And because we don't have other students coming um, that aren't in our distance learning center, our facilities and, and maintenance and transportation department is not struggling to provide some limited transportation there. In terms of special needs, that one's a little bit trickier because that is our program, uh, our, our, you know, we're owning that and and so funding and financing becomes a real challenge. I think as it is, we're gonna be having to make some really different, I mean, the collective we hear gonna make some um, difficult decisions as we head through the winter. Uh, I think after we get through the second quarter and see where we're standing, um, I think that that's probably a time where we can re-engage um, some of that dialogue and our principals are actively advocating around that. I also, it's worth noting, we are providing some in-home services and support and some of that, um, for, for some certain families who are choosing not to come in. Um, I think my opinion, I think I shared this in the past, but I'll share it again, it's a good opportunity, is that uh, the advantages from a safety perspective of providing um, in-person supports in the school building is we know what the ventilation is. Uh, we know that, you know, other than if students have a disability that prevents them, we know it's a space where people are wearing masks all the time as opposed to a home setting. So if you're working in a bedroom, that's not the case. We know these spaces are professionally cleaned uh, and maintained. We have an ongoing nurse who's there um, because we got the the state grant to provide the um, symptomatic testing if student does or staff member does feel sick. We have on-site, uh, we will soon, our applications are second round of, it's not an application, but our uh, the data they're requesting uh, will get out this week to them. Uh, we'll have antigen tests that we can use there that we can't do in person uh, for in-home. So we do feel like in-school, um, you know, is a safe place. And I think it's particularly because of what you said, Mr. Demling, is we've got spaces galore, right? So we have, we're able to provide 900 square feet, and it could be a child and, and one adult who's in that space. That's not true in, in homes um, that people have. I mean, I think, you know, perhaps some people have homes where you could provide a, a, that larger space, but for most people, that's not close to feasible. So in terms of being able to distance and able to work with them, uh, we're able to provide a, a very safe environment. Um, and I think the home environment, you know, we really appreciate everyone working in homes, but there are some real challenges with ventilation, professional cleaning, mask wearing when they're not there, especially if there's low ventilation. Um, so, you know, We've made the estimation that, you know, if we're going to provide an in-person service, um, you know, we're certainly not doing any arm twisting uh, of anyone, but uh, if people choose to be in, in the building, um, that we feel like that's the best spot for them. Sorry, it's long-winded, but I think the safety piece is really important to say, because it really is access and distance learning with, with that in-person support. So I think as we get through quarter two, we can kind of re-engage those conversations as well once we know where our financing is and, uh, and perhaps how we could expand further. Thank you. So I just, I'm assuming for the Marks Meadow and the LSSC program that I know we're not, we're giving in-kind space. Um, typically, you know, some students would normally have to pay for um, daycare, even if it was subsidized or, you know, after school programs, there are fees associated. For the students who are participating in the, these distance learning centers at Marks Meadow and LSSC or daycare centers, I'm not sure what the right word is, are, is there any cost for the family or is that funded through um, the programs? So um, Marks Meadow has um, an existing system with the state where they do have, uh, and I'm gonna blank on the right word, which I apologize. So if they're listening, I am sorry, but they essentially have um, subsidized waivers. So for students who qualify a certain number, they can access the program um, 
at low or no cost. Uh, the other students are paying in LSSC right now, I think is mostly doing it through CARES Act funds that, that are ending. Um, so I think over time we'll do that. But, you know, I think again, when we get to the end of budget quarter number or budget quarter number two, we're probably one going to look of where we are um, because we've had such success and we're hearing from families and students about the success of these programs. Um, I think we're going to have to have some some conversations on that topic. So the short story is right now, some people are paying, um, but the students that we've been advocating for in general in terms of attendance um, have primarily um, not had to pay to access the program uh, and certainly not if they're income eligible. Okay, I'll go keep going on my update. Um, as you all certainly know, there's a four town meeting on Saturday, uh, nine o'clock. First one we're doing virtually, so this will be an interesting uh, experience that we have. Um, and the four town meeting, for those who don't know, is the towns of Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury get together to have a first look at the FY22 budget. It's a particular challenge this year because there's so many, so much uncertainty. Uh, of what our schools will look like next year, what our enrollments will look like next year. We have all of our contracts or we have no contract that extends uh, beyond this year in terms of any of our bargaining units. Uh, we have really not a great sense from the state or the federal government of exactly what funds are coming our way. Um, so it's gonna be you know, perhaps a little bit more of a theoretical exercise than it typically would be. Um, but you know, we'll have numbers, we'll have a number of different assessment methods. Uh, but I think we're going to really have to caution the group that uh, the numbers we have are are not fixed. Um, you know, they're never fixed in the first meeting, but they're really pretty far from that. Uh, we have received guidance from the town of Amherst to expect as uh, a zero percent increase, um, and the town of Leverett has uh, asked us for a, uh, or has let us know and other departments that to expect no more than a 1.5 percent increase from the town of Leverett. Uh, we did receive a request from the select board in the town of Shutesbury to show a 65% statutory method. I'm not going to go into details on the superintendent update on that particular, uh, that nuanced topic, but um, as well as a 45%. So we'll try to show a range of options. Um, Doug's going to try to, he's working really hard. Dr. Slaughter is going to try to get that to committee, I would guess, Friday night. Um, we're going to, he's shooting for Friday morning, but uh, the number of variables are just much greater this year than we've ever had before. Um, so he's working pretty much, you know, locked down, working on that all week, talk to him this afternoon, and uh, we'll continue to talk to him about that. But that's the public guidance we've got. We don't typically get uh, numeric guidance from the town of Pelham or the town of Shutesbury in terms of percent increase, so that's no change, just to be really clear for, for you all and for the public. But Leverett and Amherst typically do give us financial guidance, and they've given that, uh, that to us to date. So that is a public meeting. It does not include public comment. It's not a decision-making meeting. There's no votes taken, but uh, thank you to Amherst Media for all the meetings you're covering and coming and covering that on a Saturday. Uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, we start at nine, the end at 11. Those are the two most important ground rules as we try to start on time and then we certainly end on time. Um, and again, the public is welcome to watch that meeting as well. Um, in the packet, I included a survey. Uh, we got about 82 responses, I think it was, uh, from families who have left the district. That's you know, a little less than half the families that we surveyed, uh, just because you know every year we lose some families, families move away, we gain some families, families move to town. Uh, but it, you know, I think you know it was it was a good response rate um, for that. I think you know there's a wide range of reasons why families have opted. Uh, to not be with us this year, you could see there's one or two who really didn't feel like kids should be back in school. There's more than one or two who feel like kids, you know, the in-person was really important to them and they found other options. The most important to them, most important, but very important to me was one of the questions towards the end, which indicated, are you planning to come back? And I think as you saw in the packet, the data on that is very split. Um, and that's important both for the future of the district. It's also really important for planning. Um, you know, so out of the 82 responses, 18 said definitely we'll come back in the future. Uh, 17 said likely, 19 said unlikely, eight said definitely will not, and then 20 said undecided, uh, but would consider re-enrolling uh, if certain things were different. And, and, you know, and there's a bunch of responses, all 20, I think, wrote something. Um, so it's a really helpful data source. I'm not gonna try to summarize um, 82 responses uh, um, 
at the moment, but I did want to alert you that it's in the packet as we commit to do with every survey we give. Uh, we commit to, to offering it. If we're going to, people are going to fill it, take the time to fill it out, we're going to make it public. And we did that with this survey uh, as well. It, we are noticing, particularly at the elementary level, much less so at the secondary, uh, an increasing number of students uh, over the last two weeks. Um, I think we're up to five or six who have left the district um, since we offered the survey. So it might be helpful to you know, think about readministering it at some point as we get towards spring, both because people have a better sense of the, pl the planning end of people choosing to return, but also because the survey missed people because we did start seeing um, sort of a, a second round of uh, families who are making um, other options for um, their children. Questions on that topic or comments? I shouldn't say just questions on that one. Mr. Demling? So kind of related, in, in, in if you roll it up to the big picture here, is um, when, we talk, when we think about who might be coming back and, um, and trying to get people to come back, um, the establishing and communicating what we're doing next year, to me, is a pretty massive piece of that. And you noted all the things um, that are uncertain, not just with the budget, but with the, um, with the, the staffing contracts, Right, which which could relate to what we're doing, um, and and we also it's not on the agenda tonight, but we we talked about um, thinking outside of the box in terms of the school schedule, and just basically in general, um, being able to communicate this is what next year will look like sooner as soon as we are reasonably can. Um, do do you have any? Uh, um, have you thought about that a little more in terms of like what what our general schedule is going to be I, I know that we we said we need to do fe feasibility in terms of cooling if we're going to have you know a lot of uh in person in like a summer you know that's, that's kind of like one implementation detail in terms of like the, the big arc right of like well we have a lot of things to get in line if we are going to be able to not be in august and still have things up in the air right so um is this is this like a big discussion you feel like kicks off in january is this a march thing um just kind of your thoughts on on planning for next year. The sooner the better, and that's actually a great segue. If people have other comments or questions, I'm open to them. But, but one of the things that I continue to hear from middle school and high school students is uh, a real um, one student described to me as a fear of going back to a 7:45 bell. Um, you know, right now they are on a nine o'clock bell. For the most part, there are some D period classes at the high school that are a little earlier. So I, I think Mr. Demling's onto something that that I do think the sooner we start talking about what next year could look like, the better. Um, I don't know how Ms. Gribko feels about it, but but I continue to hear that feedback from middle school and high school students that um, that that that's worth uh, trying to sort out on the sooner side. That as that that's not a quick fix. Uh, that has lots of implications um, as we we think about heading back in person. So in a not in a you know different COVID era, I wouldn't say COVID less era, but a different COVID era. Um, so uh, my opinion is actively starting those conversations on the sooner side would be my recommendation because I think there's many many layers to it. I don't want to go down the late start time conversation fully, but I think that one feels very acute in, in almost every conversation I have with any middle school or high school student. Um, you know, they see me as the conduit to that conversation, and rightly so. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can't end a conversation no matter what the topic without that coming up. I don't know, Ms. Gripko, if you hear that as well from students about the start time difference and the impact on sleep. Yeah, I've definitely heard um, that this later start time is better. So. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, it will make Mr. Demling smile, I think, if we start <laughs> talking about that, because he's been at that long before COVID was a thing. But but I think it's just one example of the many layers that we should probably start talking about sooner. Mr. Demling, actually, before we go on to that, because I did have a question on the on the survey, if we can if, uh, hold your question, Mr. Demling, I'll come back to you. Um, the, uh, some folks in the community had asked for um, some data on, on the survey regarding um, with when, um, I guess, the withdrawal date, like when they withdrawed from the school, as well as demographics. And were you able to um, splice the data in that way? Yeah, so and the withdrawal date is pretty identifiable because um, there are certain, it just is, right? I mean, um, certain dates, you know, you could definitely see a wave 
that was the first day of school. But anything that wasn't the first day of school this year, um, it, it started getting very individual, uh, which we were very cautious with data that could ever be identifiable. And, and similarly, actually, on the on the race ethnicity, I mean, I certainly can share an overview that it was, um, you know, the majority of families who have left the district are white. Um, I think when we get into, it's such a small end size, 82, that when we start getting into more granular details, it starts getting, you know, when I see an end size that's less than 10, I start getting a little nervous that we're we're getting closer to being identifiable. And there are some racial ethnic groups that are uh, below that, that kind of, and, I, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's not like why 10 and not 12 or why eight. But for me, when it gets to single digits, it starts feeling identifiable. Um, but, but what I can say is that the majority of families who have left the district are white. Thank you. Um, Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, I mean, I, I appreciate you bringing up the late start time. I know I've been on that kick, you know, in, in the past. If it wasn't clear, though, the, the thing I'm more, you know, focused on in terms of next year is guaranteeing to the public that kids are in the building. Yeah. I, mean, I feel like if, if, we, if we don't do that on the sooner side of the street, then given what's happened this year, we don't have a lot of, uh, we haven't established a, a strong level of trust in the community. Let's put it that way, in terms of saying, this is what's going to happen and then having it actually happen, right? And so, yeah, if, if we can do late start time, great. If, if it's in the cards, cool. But I don't, I don't think we're gonna get parents coming back and retain them because of late start time. I think we will get parents coming back and retain them to some degree uh, if, if the, the more that we can commit to and deliver on uh, in-person learning. So that was just a the thrust of that. Yeah, fair point. Um, there aren't any other questions. Just one thing that's come up recently is around snow days. And I think we talked all the way in the summer that we, you know, didn't plan to have snow days. You know, I think the one variable that I want to put out there is, you know, when we do have huge snowstorms, uh, you know, people have raised, um, in, and I'm not picking on Sheets Rand Lever in particular, but people have communicate that that there is often a loss of power in those communities or loss of internet when there's large snowstorms and not the inch or two inch variety but you know you're getting like eight inches a foot um, that the internet becomes very unreliable and power becomes very unreliable and it's Steve there's no disrespect to the good good folks of the DPW in the town of Shutesbury. I want to be really clear about that I think it has to do with how it was put in and the hills and topography and that Shutesbury and Leverett don't often be they're not often the first priority of the utility companies. Um, I'll put that nicely. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, we, that's really good feedback that I have to take really seriously and have to really, uh, I am doing some thinking about, you know, knock on wood, we have not had any big snowstorms to date and not our forecast in the super near future, but I may want to come back to you with some sort of uh, some thoughts on that, in a, you know, in terms of when we get to future topics, which I know is on this agenda, is, is how to manage days where there's a high probability that some of our students won't have access to the internet or won't have access to power. Um, because it's not, you know, and from what I've been told, it's not an infrequent occurrence that when there's a major snowstorm, um, it's not so much whether it'll happen, it'll be when it'll happen and how long it, it, it lasts. I don't know if Ms. Seeger or Mr. Sullivan have any thoughts on that one, but it, it's, it's been come to me from many families and many um, students, not just in Shutesbury and Leverett, but I will say that particularly in Shutesbury and Leverett, it seems like a larger issue in terms of what happens when there's a major storm. Ms. Sullivan, would you agree with that? You're my go-to person for Shutesbury, so. Yeah, it, and the issue now with the broadband is that, you know, Shutesbury owns the system, but it's run by somebody else. So when it does go down, it takes a while for someone to come out, and I think Leverett's the same. It's unlike Verizon and the power companies, it takes a few more days to get the broadband back up again. Yeah, Ms. Seegers, anything you want to add to that? Okay. So it's just, it was a really good point, and that's where, where, where it's really helpful to have community feedback, right? Because, you know, I, I know an awful lot about the roads in Shutesbury and Leverett, and I talk a lot to their DPW people, talking to their broadband people, that's a new one for me. Um, and so it was really helpful to get that feedback. So, you know, I'd like to bring back some thoughts, um, maybe the next joint meeting we have, um, or it could be a region meeting uh, to, to, on that topic. Um, the, the last one I think I have, um, Actually, one, there, there's one, you know, I just want to address this because it's come up a couple places is that uh, there seems to be some 
perception among some that I can force uh, the MOA not to exist. Um, that that sort of it's in my power to override the MOA. And so, you know, I want to like publicly address that, that, you know, technically I suppose that's true, um, but I generally don't like breaking labor laws when I know I'm breaking them. Um, and I'm pretty sure breaking the MOA, which is a signed document, it's no critique in this, uh, would, would, would be met with um, active resistance and legal opposition. Uh, and, and I get that. I'm in general a supporter of labor, right? When people have contracts, I want to follow them, right? And it's not that we never have conflicts or we never disagree on what's in a conflict and interpretation. Um, but, you know, whatever my, my professional viewpoint is on students being in school, and I think that's been pretty clear in terms of setting up distance learning centers and some of the benefits, um, I, I do not perceive that it's my discretion to disregard um, a signed contract. Um, so that's come up a couple different places, and I'm not just public comment, I think there was one or two tonight. Um, and there's no critique of the APA, there's no critique certainly of the school committee, uh, but I want to, you know, be able to communicate that I don't, I don't have the power to disregard legal documents um, that have been signed. And, you know, again, legal documents, as every legal document is prone to interpretation or subject to interpretation, um, but I have to do my best to interpret it the way um, I think the intent was. And so um, I just wanted to communicate that to the committee and the community, since it seems to be a little bit of a theme of late that... Um, you know, that I'm, you know, partially bound or something, you know, I perceive myself as bound by, by legal documents. And so I just, you know, sorry to belabor that point, but I thought it was just an important one for me to share. Mr. Demley. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like, you know, parking for the moment, my personal opinion on whether students should be back in person or not, which I, I think is pretty clear, but just putting that aside and just talking strictly about process, I've, I've continued to see coverage of um, of the topic of uh, kids going back to school in person, remote, uh, our our whole model for this year, confused about about what the change process is. And so, so, so to to piggyback on the point you just brought up that you don't have just divine intervention authority to throw an MOA away legally. In addition, the JLMSC cannot change. The MOA and the MOA is that document, that signed agreement that has that those those hard caps, right? That that twenty eight per hundred thousand, that automatic two closure of two week closure of schools, all those things that we agreed to. The JLMSC, which is that that informal board of uh, reps from the APA and the school committee, can can talk about, agree, suggest, jump up and down, make votes, but has no authority whatsoever no involvement whatsoever in changing the moa it's just to talk about and resolve issues with the current implementation of, of of the current moa and the only way that i'm sorry i'm belaboring this but i feel like we've tried to do this before and there's continued confusion so i'm just going to go on um the only way to change the moa is if the school committee and the apea board agree to talk about changing it and then which is that is to say, renegotiate the MOA and then and then agree to change it. And the school committee has asked for this on October 23rd. Uh, we got a response back from the board on October 26th, um, say, uh, saying that they did not wish to talk about it at the time. Um, we had some meetings and public comment on November 2nd. The school committee again asked the APA board uh, to talk about changing the MOA and we, and we haven't received a response. And that's that's where it stands. <laughs> right? the, the, the last update is November 2nd, we asked the APA board to talk about changing the MOA and we haven't received a response. And that's it. Um, I, I feel like, I, I, I mean, I'm honestly, I just, you know, I'm sort of commentizing here a little bit. I'm a little frustrated at just being able to articulate the process here, you know, again, parking my opinion about what should or should not happen. Um, you know, both sides need to agree to change the MOA. And if we don't agree to talk about it, um, and again, that request was made on the second and we haven't received a response, um, then 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 we're we're stopped. And and there isn't anything more the school committee can do about it in terms of do about changing the MOA. Is that it, it, have I said anything in that long rambling monologue? I'm sorry, Dr. Moore. Um, that that is Contrary to your understanding of the process? No. Okay. Thank you. And uh, unless there's more 
comments on that one. Uh, and I know it, it felt out of nowhere I said that, but I just, I'm hearing it enough places, um, you know, and I'm hearing enough references to other communities um, where superintendents did certain things. And, and that was either, uh, in most of those, it was prior to uh, a memorandum of agreement or there was a lot of gray in the memorandum of agreement. It wasn't when there was clear metrics um, defined in the memorandum of agreement. So I can understand why that is um, confusing to members of the public in this particular situation. Um, you know, I, that, that, that's where we stand. Um, the last one is just really appreciating, you know, um, Faye Brady has been involved, but particularly Diane Chamberlain, who's the principal of Fort River, uh, really spearheaded this with a parent uh, or caregiver in, in the Fort River community that we have a student um, flu shot clinic on Thursday, uh, this Thursday from 2.30 to 4.30 at Fort River School through CVS. We've sent out link they give us the wrong one we fixed it and and resent that out but you know it is a requirement for all students in massachusetts believe it or not in person or virtual to have the flu shot by january 1st um and or december 31st and so we know uh that for some families that's going to be an easier dynamic than than going to doctor's office at this point so it'll be under the tent on thursday at fort river if you're interested please check your email if you, if you can't find that email uh please just you could email me directly or Debbie Westmoreland, um, who you get emails from every Friday, uh, and we can get you the link if you need it, but it is really important, not just because of a compliance exercise, but because it's really important from a public health perspective that uh, all students receive the, the flu shot this, all, in my opinion, everyone receives the flu shot this winter. This is particularly focused on students, but my encouragement is uh, that everyone gets it. Some of you know me. Yeah, I'm quite phobic about shots. It's not my favorite thing in the world to do. I'm on the like the far end of that spectrum of comfortability with it. And, you know, so I can feel and understand people who don't want to go get a shot. And it's just, you know, every public health person I speak to talks about the importance of getting one this winter. So that's my public service uh, that I'll do on the public health front, but um, it seems I'm pretty convinced that it's an important thing. But uh, thanks to Diane and, and to CVS and, and parent guardian caregiver uh, who put on, uh, helped put on the clinic on Thursday. And that's the end of a very long update. Any, any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Um, uh, maybe I'll be able to get us a, a little bit back on track on our agenda. Um, I was going to mention, um, remind folks about the Four Towns meeting on Saturday morning, but Dr. Morris already did that. Thank you. Um, and also for uh, Amherst committee um, members on Monday um, is the, uh, the town council is hosting the state of the town meeting and presentation um, and that will have reports from the town um, the school committee and the Jones Library. So um, I've been uh, preparing that. I think uh, I will be able to send the, uh, the copy of that report to everybody on the Amherst School Committee um, when I send that over to, um, to the town council for sharing in the packet. Um, so um, thank you to Dr. Morris and, and Mr. Demling for working with me on, on pulling that, that together. Um, that is all that I have um, from the chair's update right now. Um, so moving on to school committee announcements. Are there any announcements? Um, Ms. Lord. Yes, thank you, Chair McDonald. I would just like to update the school committee and anyone who's listening or watching a little bit on what the school equity task force subcommittee has been doing recently. We worked with um, Principal Sadiq, Assistant Superintendent Cunningham and Ms. Evelyn Aquino on the restorative justice position and program in terms of how do we support it. We're doing a search when we're out of our hiring freeze, et cetera. We have some parents gathering stories of the incredible hardships some of our families are going through during this remote learning. I know we hear a lot on the public comments, but there are a lot of other voices that don't either don't have access to leaving the comments through many different reasons or can't. So we're trying to gather those voices because there's some, some concern and what different ways can we support and at least let it be known. Um, then we've been also working on goals and our mission statement and last 
meeting we had Dr. Gavera from the Family Center come and let us know all the amazing ways that program is supporting our families and we're trying to connect with how we can support that. We have a meeting tomorrow. It's our working group meeting on the first Wednesday of every month from 6 to 7.30. Thank you for this time. Um, sorry, would my co-chair, fabulous Mr. Harrington, like to add anything? Oh, that was solid. Pretty, pretty satisfied with it. Hi. Finally, <laughs> <laughs> you Mr. Harrington. And then, then I, my my update is uh, about the Joint Labor Management Safety Committee meeting. We're, we'll be meeting Friday at 4:20. I believe it's already posted on the. Uh, ARP's website. It, it's viewable through YouTube, and I, I think there's another means, but that seems to be a pretty solid way to go about it. The agenda is also posted. If anybody wants to check that out, it's really exciting stuff that goes down there. So uh, you're all welcome to join. You're all welcome. To sir, sorry. Um, Mr. Harrington, can you describe a little bit of some of the changes that you all have made on the JLMSC? Mike. Oh, Dr. Morris, sorry. Just this is an agenda item uh, for later in the meeting. So, I mean, I'm not trying to, to constrain Mr. Harrington at, in the least, but since it is an agenda item, it might might allow for a more full dialogue at that point when we're just in the region. That's great. Thank you for that reminding me of that. Um, great. And um, either uh, Mr. Sullivan or Ms. Lord, um, I know that the CES uh, Collaborative for Educational Services Board has met once or twice, and I was just wondering if you have any update for the committee on, on that work. No? Um, I could just say we've gone over, we had um, the budget presented, um, an annual audit, an annual report, they're thinking about a new strategic plan. And the biggest announcement is the executive director, who is fabulously loved and has done amazing work, Bill Deal, has retired, is retiring, and there will be a search for a new executive director. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, our uh, monthly CPAC meeting, Special Ed Parents Advisory. Advisory Council uh, is this th Thursday night, our first Thursday night meeting, switching from Friday mornings to Thursday night. That's 6.30 to 8. Um, you can find more info at arps.org slash CPAC or just email CPAC at arps.org. It's a packed announcements night. Are there any more? <laughs> Great. Um, so we'll move on to our new and continuing business. And our first item is um, a resolution on um, regarding the MCAS testing and um, possible vote. Um, I think Mr. Demling shared that, um, circulated that earlier um, this week. So hopefully folks have been able to read through that. Uh, Mr. Demling, are you able to share your screen maybe and so that folks can see it again? Maybe not. I can try. I can try. I need to find it. <laughs> I've got it if you'd like me to display it. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Good. Chair McDonald, do you want to give me do you want me to give a little intro to this? Sure, please. <laughs> okay, so this is basically a combination of uh, the MCAS, not the MCAS, the MASC. Um, resolution that passed a few weeks ago and uh, Joe Comerford's bill of a similar nature uh, th that we talked about last time th that we sent the links out. Uh, and what I tried to do is, is basically copy and paste from that and then just hit the, the main points um, that both of them were, uh, were, were hitting on. So those first three whereas are just um, straight from the um, MASC resolution talking about the um, the inequities in, in, in the, the um, uh, 
uh, that happened with remote learning and the social emotional impact and then the uh, the lack of in-person instruction. You know, there, so then there's the bullet points of, of what this is resolved for. And so I, I separated them, in, um, you know, in case there is uh, committee support for some, but not all of these items. So the first one is is for the students who missed their 10th grade MCAS testing last year not be required to make it up this year or ever as a requirement for their graduation. Uh, the second bullet is uh, a three-year moratorium on the MCAS as a graduation requirement. The third one's a little hard to describe. It's a, a moratorium for three years on high stakes decisions about students, educators, and districts. Um, in, in both the Comerford Bill and the MASC resolution, what exactly constitutes high stakes is a little ambiguous. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, there, there is a, a state model for evaluating districts that, that has a few different components. Um, there's obviously staff evaluations, um, depending on, on how we, we choose to use that. Um, it's, it's unclear whether there is high stakes for a student other than a graduation requirement. Um, you, you do hear this a lot um, with, with the rhetoric, particularly from the MTA and some other um, state level advocacy groups when, when they're talking about um, wanting to suspend the MCAS. Um, I, I, I just my two cents, this is probably the bullet item I feel the least tied to just because we haven't really had a broad discussion about um, uh, the role of standardized testing in educator and district evaluation. We've been more focused so far, at least in our discussions about its impact as a graduation requirement. And then the last um, call is is straight from the Comerford Bill, is establishing a, a commission to look at piloting alternatives to um, uh, using standardized testing in, in these various methods. So there you go. Thank you, Mr. Denling. Um, I feel like the what the the resolution as as you've drafted it really captures a lot of what we discussed um, at our last meeting. So um, thank you for putting that all to, pulling that all together um, and sharing that back with us. Any what comments or uh, thoughts questions from the committee? Ms. Spitzer. So thank you for putting this together. Um, I generally, um, like you said, I, I definitely support it um, in light of everything that's been going on with COVID. I'm also happy to um, take out some of the sections that you said we haven't had as much time to discuss, but as it's written, I generally would support it. Um, the minor, minor things, the last sentence, um, and finally we call for the establishment of a statewide commission. I think it should be approach to goal setting student assessment and evaluation and not or um and then i was just comparing it to you know i quickly googled mcas and joe comerford um so, so it looks like in some of the documents online for her she's asking for a four-year moratorium so i'm curious about why we have it as a three-year moratorium instead of just curious about the thought you had around that mr Denver. Yeah, so the, the um, MASC resolution calls for three years, and Joe's bill called for four, so I had to pick one. <laughs> I could have done three and a half. <laughs> um, no, that's, uh, yeah, that, that was arbitrary. I mean, I just, I just, uh, I just sort, of, sort of picked that arbitrarily. I, the, the one thing, I, too, I didn't, I didn't point out is that is not here is, uh, it doesn't, so this, this resolution, and, and neither does the MASC resolution or the Comerford bill explicitly say, it, it doesn't specifically say the MCAS should not be administered. It talks about what it should not be used for, right? So even the MASC resolution doesn't say don't don't run the MCAS. It says don't use it for X Y Z. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. Um, there is there is one subsection in, in the Comerford Bill uh, where where she says um, call upon the um, federal government to waive the requirement for standardized testing, which would then allow us not to have to administer it. So it's kind of implied, but hey, this opens the door to not having to do any standardized testing. Um, I think that's a bigger, much bigger discussion about not doing any standardized testing whatsoever for any purpose, um, rather than tying this as a graduation requirement. So 
but it wasn't even in uh, that bill anyway, so it's, it's not in there. It, it is just audible because if you look at it this quick, you might feel, oh, it's, a, it's an anti-standardized testing resolution, and that, that really isn't what either the Comfort for Bill or the MCAS uh, and the ASC resolution is. Any other questions or comments? I, um, I'll, I'll just add that while I agree that we haven't had a, a big discussion about how the MCAS is used for other high stakes decisions other than, or actions other than require, graduation requirement, I, I'm comfortable with the way that you've worded it here. Um, and, and knowing that there's other bills and resolutions that sort of detail that more clearly, um, I, I think you know, it's this is about stating our, our beliefs and our and our values about this, and I think that we agree with that. And so, this is we're not the ones that have to write the bill that then has to have all the details to, you know, not the giant loopholes for you know for that people can get through. So we we have the luxury of not having to worry about that <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, and I I feel like that that statement there expresses. The values that we were discussing um, and expressing last week or two weeks ago when we last met and talked about this. Our, um, would folks like to move to make a motion to support this resolution? Ms. Spitzer? Um, I, I will make the motion. I just want to clarify do we need to make a motion for Amherst and a a motion for the region separately. Okay, so I'll start with Amherst then. So I, I move that the Amherst School Committee approve um, this motion, uh, sorry, <laughs> this resolution regarding MCAS testing. Um, moved by Spitzer. Um, I'll second that. Seconded by McDonald. We'll take a roll call vote. Oh, uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, Ms. Spitzer, if you would accept a friendly amendment to as approve the resolution as amended by Ms. Spitzer. <laughs> so to grab that typo, sure. So <laughs> I'm, I will accept that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Demling. <laughs> so we'll take a uh, roll call vote at, um, of the Amherst School Committee. So Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously five to zero. I will make a similar motion for the regional school committee that we, um, that we endorse or approve this resolution as amended by Ms. Spitzer. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Dancer? Dancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously nine to zero. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your screen, Dr. Morris. Um, and now our next item is future agenda planning. Um, we don't, so we keep referencing that, that document that um, I, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can sort of get dates up onto the website showing as tentative plans, because I know that some folks in the community have been looking for what are our future meetings sort of beyond when we actually decide to post one. Um, I don't know if we share this document or just sort of list the possible dates um, with sort of a note subject to change. <laughs> um, might be helpful. Um, but right now, um, so in addition to the four towns meeting that the regional school committee has on Saturday morning, um, we had a placeholder for an Amherst School Committee meeting next Tuesday, December 8th, 
I believe the only item that we may, might have would be the Caminantes lottery and sibling policy um, if, if we were to meet next week. So I might recommend that we not meet next week and instead um, look to the January 12th meeting um, that would potentially have the budget update on the Q2 of this fiscal year, as well as the Caminantes um, policy in January. Are folks okay with that timing for the lottery? Mr. Demling? Yeah, and um, we could probably, if, if we're getting the MSBA enrollment letter in this month, then that could also go, MSBA update could also be on the January Amherst meeting. Yep, that's great. Um, we we haven't gotten to this agenda item for the regional school committee, but um, we will have, so for the following week, December 15th, we will have, um, or hopefully we'll have the vote on the uh, MOA with the AFS CME. Um, so we haven't gotten to that part of the agenda to say that we're not voting on that tonight. Um, so uh, ideally we'd be able to have that on December 15th. Dr. Morris, I, I see you've added access testing. Can you describe what that is? Sorry, I'm having some connection problems, so I missed quite a bit of that, Ms. McDonald. Oh, I'm um, talking about the December 15th proposed next meeting for the Regional School Committee. Um, sure. Yeah. So uh, at that point, hopefully we'll be able to vote on the, uh, we'll have an AFSCME um, MOA, um, which was on the agenda tonight, but is not ready. Um, as that body has not come to uh, a vote itself uh, at this point yet. Um, we talked about perhaps putting access testing on there. They've now expanded the window when we're supposed to receive some more guidance. So relevant that will be. Um, so um, I, there may be other items like the one Mr. Demling talked about or other things people wanna add, but those were the only two that I had uh, listed at this point in time. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if if we wanted to take that time to start the to talk about the in school planning is that um, which Mr. Demling you brought up earlier. Um, well, I think it'd be a good one. We could review the four town meeting, which is a financial, but also talk about. I mean, that'll start a kick off a broader conversation, perhaps about FY twenty two more generally, uh, not just the fiscal year, but the academic side of things as well. That sounds good. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned in talking about the budget, the, all the uncertainties in planning FY22 budget being one of them being the many uh, contracts, labor contracts that are expiring this year and we don't have that information. Is that a topic that we need to, do we need to appoint new, I believe we have all of our uh, bargaining members uh, I think we do. Yeah. Um, so in, unless one of them, unless there's a desire for change um, from one of the members who's currently there, um, I think we're, I think we're covered on that one. Okay. If not, I'll let you know. Okay. We may actually want to have an executive session. Um, we may want it may choose to do that in December just to start talking about all those contracts that are potentially expiring. I'm glad you you raised that. That that's sort of where my head was going. I think it might be that early. Yeah, and even if it's just to talk, I mean, obviously it would occur in, in uh, executive session, but just about timing, and just having some of the preliminary conversations uh, so the committee can get its um, be able to have uh, have that conversation sooner. Great. Any other, Ms. Stancer? Um, I, I'm wondering, are we anticipating that we won't then meet again until January after the 15th of December? That's that's the proposal. Okay. Did you want to meet it? <laughs> Mr. 
Are there any other thoughts about ads for December 15th or January for the Amherst School Committee? Obviously, there's time for both of those. So um, if, if anything does occur to you, um, uh, send them um, my way. Um, okay, with that, we'll move on to our next item, which is a warrants report. Um, oh, Dr. Morris. So just one thing to note is that AFSCME has been done this year and the MOA has been done by Ms. Cunningham primarily, who, who's done a good job with it. But I think as we're looking at a successor contract, perhaps it might be good for a school committee rep to join that group. It doesn't need to be decided tonight, um, but just uh, I was remiss in, in, in saying that because I think it's been the MOA has been managed you know, by staff. But I think if we're looking at a, a multi-year contract, particularly as we're looking at multiple multi-year contracts, potentially multiple, at least not MOAs. Uh, based on COVID, but more functional uh, contracts that aren't, aren't specific to a pandemic, it'd probably be good to have a, a school committee rep on that group as well. And historically we have. So again, not for today, but just that might be um, something that um, we talk about in the near future. Yeah. Could be at our December meeting, the 15th. Okay. Um, I have three warrants. Um, Ms. Spitzer, I don't know. Um, I have three as well, so okay. I'll come up if you'd like me to go first. I'm happy to. Okay, go for it. Great. Um, first one was an annual scholarship payment, which I authorized by my signature on um, November 17th, 2020, in the amount of $1,000. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $714,680.92 for a warrant dated November 18th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $713,380.92 and revolving fund expenses of $1,300. And I signed this on November 19th, 2020. Um, I authorized by my signature to to payables in the amount of $941,435.80 for the warrant dated November 20th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $416,267.87, revolving fund expenses of $4,859.16, grant fund expenses of $519,000, $519,812.64 and other funds in the amount of $496.13 for capital. And this was signed and dated on um, November 20th, 2020. And that's all. Okay. Um, so speaking for the Amherst School Committee, um, I authorized by my signature to payables the amount of $141,399.32 for a warrant dated November 20th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $72,661.24, revolving fund expenses of $417.90, grant fund expenses of $4,205.58, FEMA fund of $11,779.50, school reopening fund in the amount of $3,523.30, COVID relief grant, oops, nothing, um, CARES fund uh, act money of $48,519.38, and a gift to the school of $292.42, and I signed that on November. 20th. Um, awesome. And, uh, I also authorized by my signature um, to payables in the amount of $30,879.22 for a warrant dated November 23rd, 2020. It included general fund expenses of $3,810.81, revolving fund expenses of $3,051.81, grant fund expenses of $15,942.72, FEMA fund of $7,770, K 
CARES Act fund of $303.88, gift to the school of $292.42, and that was also signed on um, uh, November 23rd. Actually, November 20th, sorry. Um, and then last, I authorized by my signature to payables for uh, the payroll in the amount of $697,568.82. Um, and I signed that December 2nd, 2020. Actually, the payroll is dated December 2nd, 2020. I signed it December 1st, 2020. Sorry. Uh, with that, um, we have next is gifts, and I don't, we do have uh, two gifts for the Amherst School Committee. Um, I will, uh, I'll just continue with the motion. Um, I'll move to accept gifts um, as follows from Martha Olver, number 995854, to support Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $10. Um, another gift from Martha Olver, number 995900, in, to support Crocker Farm at the principal discretion in the amount of $10 for a total of $20. Is there a second? Second. Um, moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer, um, and we will take a roll call vote again of the Amherst School Committee. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Karen, can I? Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Motion passes five to zero. And does somebody from Amherst want to make another motion? I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Lord, second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. There's no discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, uh, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. <laughs> Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst School Committee is adjourned. And now we move to the Regional School Committee topics. Um, we have our first order is approving minutes, but I don't believe I saw them in our packet debate. No, okay. So we will skip that item. Um, and we will move to public comment. And we do have a couple uh, public comments for the region. And so I will share my screen. And as a reminder for folks watching at home, um, this document is posted on the um, ARPS.org website on the Regional School Committee agendas page. Oops, sorry, started midway through.
Okay. Um, so as mentioned earlier, um, we do not have the memorandum of agreement for AFS CME for tonight. So we will skip item 14 on our agenda and move on to the winter sports discussion. And I see that Ms. Stewart joined us. Welcome. Um, so yeah. we'll head over to Dr. Morrison, Ms. Stewart. Thank you. And so uh, I want to do a little bit of framing on this one as well. So I think last time uh, the regional school committee did vote on one of the sports, um, girls hockey. Um, since we met last, we've had m multiple conversations, got additional information from Rupert Roy Clark, our facilities director, uh, about ventilation. We've also had conversations, Victoria more than me, but I've been a part of one of them, uh, with Emma Dragon, the relatively new Amherst health director. She's not new as being a health director, but relatively new to Amherst. Um, and so we're going to come by and what Ms. Stewart's going to present is a revised presentation with much more information for you all to consider tonight. Um, it's been publicly, right, you can see the, the some of the public comments. You know, we put this up yesterday uh, at some point uh, with some recommendations. And really the recommendations are coming from the conversations with both of those people, um, primarily with Ms. Dragon, but also that's informed by the conversations on ventilation and air changes. Um, I want to really appreciate Ms. Stewart, who has, uh, this is not an easy uh, gig to have at the moment. We know how much sports are valued. We know their, their particular value in a situation where, to be very blunt, I don't anticipate secondary students being um, back in in-person school this winter. Uh, maybe something will change, but I think there, there's no evidence right now that would point in that direction. And we know that social connections are incredibly important. And, you know, our approach, and you'll hear this tonight, has been, to follow the advice we've got from the public health professionals. Uh, and that, that's the way we approach things. That's the way we've approached things throughout, you know, multiple processes. And I think as it relates to athletics, you know, there, there's, there's additional variables that make it that much more complicated. Um, and, uh, you know, just want to share that. And, um, you know, what we'll ask at the end of the night is to consider all the sports uh, to get your feedback, and I know you're in a very precarious situation in terms of voting. I know there's really strong feelings on, on um, multiple strong feelings uh, about uh, sports, and we've heard some in public comment. I know I've heard from other families, and, and Ms. Stewart has heard from even more. Uh, but I think what we'd like to do is just kind of reset things. Last time, I think we didn't have even the MIA pieces. We, I think we, we only have the EEC pieces. So there's a lot more Ms. Stewart will share. I'll be in charge of slides. Ms. Stewart will be mostly uh, doing the communicating, uh, and then we can pause at the end and see if there's, uh, you know, we could pause throughout, but then at the end, see if there's broader questions that the committee would have. Um, anything else to add before we, uh, before I display, start displaying things, Victoria? No, I think that's everything. Yeah. Okay. So let me do that. Just let me know when you want to advance the slide. Okay. All right, I guess we can advance there because you gave it a little introduction, but I added some snowflakes, so it looks a little different for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, Very nice touch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, like Dr. Morris said, now the modifications are out um, from the Board of Directors. Uh, and with that announcement, a couple of things have changed since we last met. Uh, girls, ice hockey actually has been pushed back again um, to December 14th. Um, this is only this only applies to girls ice hockey and all other sports still remain at the January 4th start date as of now. Um, again, you guys saw this before, but uh, basketball, hockey are high risk sports, um, according to the EA guidelines, alpine and Nordic skiing are also our low risk sports and then swim and dive are moderate risk sports. So that hasn't changed. Um, but when we go on to the next slide you will see that the MIA actually moved indoor track to the floating season, the same season as football. So um, I don't know, we'll see what that looks like. I don't know if it's gonna be indoor, if they're thinking we can actually go outside, um, but they actually moved it to uh, the floating season as well. So we're looking to have it there. Um, Alpine skiing. So a couple of the modifications that you'll see is masks need to be worn at all times. This is something that you'll see on all the sports that I will present. Uh, workouts also need to be conducted in pods. Um, so that'll be like some of their training that they do in the weight room um, or anything else. Also the starting line, everyone needs to be six feet apart. Um, and right at the end of the conclusion of the event, they need to disperse and leave, um, go to their buses 
and get ready to go back. Um, and then also the course can actually be previewed for alpine skis. So that's a little bit different than cross country. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind, but there's not as that many modifications there. Why don't we pause just if, if there are any questions, there may not be, but any questions about alpine before we go to other, uh, another sport? I'm just curious, um, how many, um, if you could give us an estimate sort of based on prior years, approximately how many students or athletes participate in each of these sports, that would be helpful. On all of them or just this one in particular? All of them. Okay, yep. As you go through. Yes, yeah, so Alpine, it's a lot smaller. I would say it's about 14. Um, it's a smaller one, so the pods aren't gonna be an issue at all. And I'll just get that up too, to have all the numbers. Ms. Spitzer? Just wondering if the pods, um, only during the workout or just for travel, transportation, do they need to be potted too? No, not for, not for transportation. That's strictly for the workouts. I think it is worth noting too uh, that, you know, the weight room has been, the ventilation testing has been completed and it, it satisfies the uh, four uh, or above air, air changes per hour. Uh, I think it's just important to note because you'll hear more about ventilation throughout this presentation uh, on a variety. Obviously, the, the primary sport is done outside, but the weight room is, is not outside. Okay. So for basketball, we are looking at, you know, same thing, masking to be worn at all times. There's no jump ball. Um, so instead of a jump ball, it's going to be like football where there's coin toss and then that team has possession first. That's in the beginning of the game. The free throws, that situation is a little bit different. No one will be at the line on the first free throw. Uh, the other free throws falling, if it's the last one, there will be four people instead of six. Uh, the ball won't be taken out of bounds um, below the hoop to avoid clustering underneath the hoop. It'll be at free throw line extended. No halftime, so there's two minutes and 30 minutes between each quarter. And then the team uh, benches also need to be six feet apart. So it kind of look like, I don't know if any of you guys watch the NBA, but they kind of have the staggered chairs. So that's something that we could also do. And then uh, the process for the intentional fouls at the end of the game, that's going to be a little different. So, you know, when you're down two and you want to foul so they can shoot their free throw and hopefully miss, um, the coach is actually going to be able to call out the foul. So if you want to foul number five, the coach um, will call out, I want to foul number five instead of, the kids actually going in there and fouling when you know it's going to happen. So the referees will call that then. And the, the air quality of the gym right now, it's still being worked on as well. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah if I could add, Ms. Stewart, do you mind if I add to that? Um, no, that's totally fine. Yep. We alluded to that, I think, last time. So uh, it's been tested and uh, Mr. Roy Clark is in the process of securing three very large uh, space air purifiers that uh, will bring it above four air changes per hour, or yeah, four air changes per hour, and that is, uh, they're slated to be here prior to the start of the season in January. Um, so we think we'll actually be well above four, uh, and we'll get it retested, um, but, you know, we feel confident that we'll be able to get the gym above four, and that's not only useful for basketball, that's going to be useful for other uses of the gym that might happen in the future as well. Again, I don't think we're going to be in a COVID-free world anytime super soon. And, um, you know, gym classes happen there. Many other uh, activities happen in there. So we feel like it's a worthwhile purchase from our capital funds, um, not just for the, the enjoyment of kids who play basketball, but for, you know, general use of the gym or, um, as well. And we're looking at 33 kids there, too, just to keep the number in mind for boys basketball. For boys. Um, so is there girls basketball also? Yes, but I was just going to say that when we talk about girls, but girls is 20. Okay. Um, yeah. Several questions. Um, I'll start with Ms. Lord and then Ms. Stancer. I'm um, curious about what the attendance in terms of observers or spectators would be. We were playing on no spectators. That was our discussion with our um, Board of Health Director as well. Thank you. Ms. Stancer. That was also my question. Thank you. Mr. Harrington. Well, that kind of raised a question for me. Are, are you gonna? Are you planning on doing any sort of like streaming of games, something like that, like how they do like AAU tournaments and all? Yeah, um, just a little bit, probably like maybe like a Facebook Live, not as um, mm -hmm. advanced as those other streaming services. But yeah. Any other questions? 
Okay. Okay, so then we have um, hockey. So for the hockey modifications, the MI also came up, no ma uh, they need to wear masks at all times. The benches, we also have to make sure we have, we're six feet apart. Um, what hockey rinks are doing right now is some are gonna be on the bench and then some will be behind the bench at the hockey rink. At the conclusion of the contest, coaches and players just take off your skates and then go to your buses. Um, there's the face-off, everyone has to wait until the referee calls you in, um, the people that are doing the face-off and stay six feet apart until the referee just blow the whistle. Uh, one person a penalty box at a time. If another player ends up getting a penalty, they just have to stay on their bench um, until the penalty box is empty. And then there's, again, there's like a time, I don't know if you guys know hockey, but when the puck's against the board, it's called the scrum, uh, they have to wait. Um, what happens is normally the referee will let you play it out. Unfortunately, uh, this year they could stop it and there should only be two people at that moment in time there. So that's the same rules for girls hockey, which will be the next one too. Uh, we're looking at 32 players um, for ice hockey uh, and three for our girls hockey team. And um, Victoria, do you mind sharing what you found out from the rink in terms of ventilation? Because I think that that'll relate to recommendations later, but I think as we're doing yeah. sport by sport, it's helpful to have the comparison. Yeah, so um, I reached out because I know we know all about our gyms and stuff like that. So our the hockey rink is looking at uh, one ACH about an hour, um, and we are trying to get to four. It's a, just a little different um, with hockey rinks um, and spaces in general. Um, but yeah, that is what they reported. Any questions on hockey before we roll through them again? The last slide or second to last slide, one of those uh, will have the full list of recommendations, but any hockey specific questions at this point? Mr. Sullivan? No, it's actually not hockey specific. It's more about basketball. Why can we only have scrums with one person from each team with hockey, but there's no mention of the, you know, like jump ball tie-ups in basketball where you could have a number of people going after the ball at the same time. Why are they chosen to just go after hockey? I think because in hockey, you're, they let it play out a lot more. Jump balls, the refs normally call it anyways. Um, and from watching a lot of games, they call it even earlier, uh, which can be frustrating for a coach, but would make a lot of sense this time. Mr. Denley. So that, that one ACH that you mentioned, is that at the one rink that the boys hockey team plays at? Or is it the most common rink? And then how does that relate to the ACH at the, at the rink or rinks that the girls hockey team would be playing at? So I don't know the ACH levels of the, where the girls hockey would be playing at. Um, I definitely can look into it. A couple of those rinks, it's a little bit harder to get the contact information all out. Um, but I will look into that. Uh, there's a lot more that the girls would be going to. Um, and another thing to keep in mind, which I was going to go, you know, at the end of the last slide, we're not recommended to travel anywhere that doesn't meet those requirements anyway. So I would have to figure out all that information. So that's the same for basketball. If other courts do not meet those requirements, um, swimming is going to be different because it's going to be virtual, which you'll see later on. Um, if the courts don't meet those requirements, we are going to have to be at home. So that would be the same thing for hockey, except that our home rink right now is Greenfield because um, Amherst is not renting out this year. Mr. Harrington. So um, I'm assuming there's no playoffs in any of these sports or are there, there playoffs? Is, is that that's accurate? Yeah, no playoffs. There's no tournament. It's just going to be bubble competition um, and then the end of the season. Yeah. I'm sensing a lot of general questions, so maybe we'll let Ms. Stewart go through the rest of her presentation to the recommendations and we can keep asking questions. So Nordic is very similar to cross country. Um, masks need to be worn at all times, staggered starts, which you saw in cross country, um, waves again, the skiers must be spaced out six feet apart and then 14 feet apart from the other schools, the three minute stagger between the waves, um, and then the skiers must leave right after. So that is exactly the same as cross country had to follow this fall. So those modifications are identical. Swimming. Swimming, uh, we are in the process um, of finished, uh, f figuring out the air quality in there. Um, it's looking good though. Uh, all must wear masks at all times. 
um, when not swimming. Uh, other than that, that's all. The, that's when they have to wear their masks. Um, at the end of each race and event, they need to exit the pool on the opposite side. So they start on the starting block. They're just going to get an extra lap in um, and get out of the pool that way. Uh, the only difference is relays. Relays, they're going to get out of the pool instead of staying by the block, which is normally a rule. They actually can go to the side, put their masks on. Uh, the visiting team, these, those two, that line is irrelevant. There's going to be no visiting team. The PBIC will come out that all swim meets are going to be virtual this year. Um, so that's going to be remain the same. And then another thing to keep in mind about the pool is that it still needs to be filled. Um, it takes a couple weeks to be filled. It's also um, finances are also involved with filling the pool. So we just have to keep that in mind when going forward. As far as recommendations go, um, this is all after consulting with our public health director um, and her recommendations for sports this year uh, for this winter are alpine, basketball, Nordic and swimming. Basketball and swimming are contingent on the ventilation results and improvement um, in these spaces. We have uh, four air chamber. The swimming pool was designed to have well over four air changes per hour. And many of the rooms that come as that designed, uh, we anticipate will be over four air changes per hour. So that's good and promising. Um, there will also be more home games, like I said before, for basketball games, unless other schools show that they do meet those recommended um, air ventilation requirements that we are looking for. Uh, the only, uh, unfortunately, the only sport that our health director does not recommend is ice hockey. With air quality being a prominent factor in indoor sports, we are looking, we cannot ensure that the four air chambers per hour that is recommended. Um, in addition, she's also concerned with the recent clusters associated with the sport of hockey itself. Um, so that is what our board of health director recommends. Um, if you guys have any questions, I am more than welcome to take them. Ms. Stancer. Um, I'm wondering if I know that before the rinks were closed and cleaning was done and they reopened with new guidelines, whether there have been additional clusters and if so, where? Um, I know early on, uh, before all of that, that there had been some cases, but as you could see in the quotes from the governor, a lot of the problems have been because of the, not the hockey rink and not the people, the kids playing, but the people who have attended. So um, I'm wondering, do we have current data since they've reopened the rinks about how the infection rate has been? So the documentation that um, our board of health director gave me had states such as New Jersey, um, which you may have heard of that just got shut down. Um, and then Minnesota as well. Um, and then the recent one in Vermont, I believe it is. So those are the ones that she has given so far. So we have no data about Massachusetts where our kids would be playing. Well, she did mention just the recent, uh, like what happened beforehand as well with the whole cluster. Okay. All yes. right, thank you. No problem. I'd be curious to understand, sort of building on Ms. Stancer's question, how much of that those other clusters in other states were similar to the experience in Massachusetts where it was families or coaches, like not the players and not, not arising out of the gameplay itself. Um, because in, in thinking sort of similar to what one of the commenters said in the public comment is that the play and sort of the MIA, MIAA guidance on, on the play of hockey is such that A, if there's no spectators, um, you're, you're not going to have the spectators congregating um, around, you know, either in the rink, around the rink, at the rink, and, and that you, um, the gameplay and the exposure is limited to the on ice time. Um, and there's 10 kids on the ice at any, um, at any one time, two of whom stay at opposite ends of the ice and, and only occasionally see um, close contact and intermittent contact. Um, so at most, they'd be there for an hour and a half um, inside the building. 
um, even even with practices. So those that sort of gameplay suggests that the 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 potential for contact is very very limited compared to sort of that the pre shutdown experience. And we know that those cases, at least in Massachusetts, so I'm curious about the other states, it comes from activity outside of the ice, um, off ice activities, off ice gatherings, family gatherings, um, parents and coaches gatherings. Um, it, it, so I, 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 I liken this to very similar to sort of, you know, our argument for in person schooling and, and, and education that we've created a very safe um, school building. Um, we and, and protocols and procedures um, that that we're comfortable with the safety of our students being in there. And so, is it how is that different when we we have all these safety structures? And really, should we are we looking at the right data to to evaluate whether um, whether it could be safe? I think the other thing I would add is that um, similar to what one of the commenters commented is many, if not most, of these kids are playing club hockey on the rinks, the very rinks that we're talking about. Um, and I was curious to see the, the GSL, Greater Springfield League data, um, or experience in terms of the number of cases they've seen. Because I haven't seen it, the league that my son plays in plays all over the state. Um, and I think somebody else mentioned that too. So in terms of exposure, that his team has had zero cases and, um, and, and the like. So I, I think, having the right data and understanding the data is, is really, really important to understand the risk. So I don't know if, if we, we know that from the others. Um, Ms. Spencer, um, Ms. Spitzer has her hand up. So if I, if it's okay, I'll go with her first and come back to you. Ms. Spitzer. Fine, thanks. It's, so I'm gonna have a slightly different point of view on all of this and it's, it's um, I really appreciate the fact, first of all, that we got the health director's input because I think it's, it's essential that we listen to the health guidance. And so, you know, if anything, I'm feeling more conservative than what's being recommended and have a lot of concerns um, based on the fact that our teams aren't just playing in our community, that we're bringing folks into our community and then our children are gonna be going to other communities. And right now we're experiencing um, an upward trend in both positivity rates and overall numbers of cases. And this is especially true in Hamden County, which I believe some of our, and um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that our kids would be traveling to these communities in order to play. So I think it's great that we're talking about only playing in places where we are able to assure that the air changes or the standards that we would you, you know, want in our schools are being the same in other schools. So. Um, you know, I, at one of, you know, at Bay State hospitals right now, people aren't able to have visitors in the hospital. The number of cases are at the, uh, you know, people hospitalized in the hospital right now, it's at the same levels that they were in April. And I realize this is Hamden County and not Hampshire County, but the fact is that with the positivity rate there is about 6%. Um, and it's been that way for over averaging that for a week. So, um, I guess my biggest concern is the high risk, not that it's in our community right now, but that sports inherently involve a lot of travel and we don't, um, we don't have um, ability to control that. And it's really unfortunate. I wish things were trending downwards. So I think my gut is to go with what the health director is recommending and to, you know, because if anything, I would be going more conservatively and like indoor basketball, indoor swimming, they, they, they both make me nervous, but I think I'm going to, go with what our health directors recommended and what um, I'm assuming what our coaches and, and administration have recommended as well. So I, it's really hard, but I'm wondering if we can, is hockey a sport that could be moved into that shoulder, I forget the term that they're using, into that other season that football and indoor track is at, and maybe in February, things could be trending downwards. We might be having much lower um, cases in our hospitals and in our communities, and it might be a, a different picture. Because today, I, I think this makes sense to just rely on the health director and, and their recommendation. Dr. Morris? Yeah, a couple of things in responding to the questions. Um, so I think one is that I know there are other communities who are opting not to have hockey this season. Um, so. I can't promise that there'll be another season, but we're not alone. Um, 
you know, in both Hampshire and Franklin County. I know there are school committees who have made similar decisions. Um, some sort of the same reasons as we're talking about here, some because some of the hockey teams um, and some of our other sports are co-ops, which I'm comfortable with, but not every, you know, athletic director or superintendent co-op, meaning that there's students from multiple schools who play for the same team because some of the small schools don't have enough students to uh, make their their own, their a full team. Um, you know, I think to the point about the health director is um, certainly it's the school committee's will to do what it chooses. Um, and I understand the com competing viewpoints on hockey. Um, I think, you know, I think the, it's the only sport on here where we can't control the ventilation and the environment. Uh, and I'll just say for me, based on my conversations and our conversations by RM, including Victoria in this, uh, with the health director, that's a cause of concern. Um, you know, we can say, well, we're not going to play basketball in any gym that is X air changes per hour. Uh, we don't really have that capacity. We don't have a hockey rink in our district. Um, and and I, my understanding, although I am far from an expert, is that it, the ventilation in a hockey rink because of the humidity in the temperature is sort of, it's a hard one. Whereas in the swimming pool, it's the opposite. You actually want to have really good ventilation because otherwise you get really stinky swimming pools. Um, just because nature of chlorine and water and, and all that. So, you know, I think for, for, for me, I won't speak for Victoria, although I think we're in the same place on this, there's, there's an element of loss of control um, with that sport that's not necessarily true as, with the other indoor sports where we can choose not to play in other gyms. Um, and that might have consequences. It might mean less games if schools are unwilling to always be coming to Amherst, but, but we have more control. And, you know, I know from the health director's viewpoint, um, that was important to her as well about the ventilation piece and Victoria finding out the, the ventilation in, up in Greenfield. Again, I don't pretend to be a public health expert, you know, like everybody else here. We're reading a lot and trying to know as best we can. Um, but her, you know, Victoria can, can expand on this if she wants, but her feedback was very direct about hockey and her concerns about hockey. Um, and so um, from my perspective, you know, she's a health professional we rely on. Um, and, you know, I know the limitations of my knowledge, but that, that's sort of where, you know, the loss of control, the ventilation concerns, uh, and her perspective made us come with this recommendation to you all. And obviously if, if the committee is in a different place and it's in a different place and we'll, we'll move forward. But I, I just wanted to explain at least our thinking and where it came from, um, you know, and, and, you know, what, what Ms. Dragon's thinking was on this as well. Victoria, did I capture that pretty accurately? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Demling and then Ms. Kenny. Yeah, so um, just in terms of, to, uh, did you want me to go ahead? Yes, Mr. Demling and then Ms. Stancer, you had your hand earlier, so then Ms. Kenny, sorry. Um, so yeah, just in terms of process, I feel comfortable voting on every sport except for hockey tonight. And then I don't know if this is practical, but we were talking about an agenda planning of having a meeting on the 15th. Um, I feel like what I'm starting to hear from comments, uh, and, and in addition to the information provided by Ms. Stewart and, and Dr. Morris, is that so much of the hockey decision has weighed on the input from the Amherst Health Director. I, it, I would like to hear from her directly to be able to be able to make that kind of decision. Um, I don't. I don't feel super comfortable saying no to uh, to the hockey to canceling the hockey seasons now, given that they're not starting till January and we could potentially have another meeting. And um, so, so that's, that's one just in terms of process. Um, and yeah, it, uh, yeah, the other point I wanted to make is, you know, when we talk about creating a safe environment for our kids, right? And, and sports is a little different because we're not talking about staff and we're talking about students opting in and, and whatnot. Um, you know, we're talking about distancing, masks, um, uh, other factors like adult behavior, and then the air exchange. And obviously the ideal is to have every one of those factors at an optimal level, right? Six or more feet, masks all the time, air exchange, four or more, and you know, no other variables. Um, I, I, I don't, in terms of practicality, I, I don't feel like it has to be every single one of those optimal levels in order to green light something. So, so that's where, where I, I'm, I'm a little torn on the hockey thing is that I, I understand that you can't guarantee four ACH in a, in a hockey rink, but when you have something like um, 
you know, where, where the distancing and the masks and, and the other adult behavior is is so regulated, um, it it's it suggests the ACH doesn't have to be that 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 optimized, right? Um, and and there and and whether or not there's transmission going on to any degree within a game or not, I th what I think can be definitively said is that there is not definitive evidence that there is transmission from players on a, on, on the rink. Like it that it might be going on, but the, it's certainly not been established, right? And so I I, I feel hesitant to to vote uh, and, and and cancel that 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 kind of a season. Uh, you know, particularly when and Mr. Sullivan brought up a good point. You know, I feel. I, I'm also uncomfortable at, you know, the shot goes up, there's a rebound and four people are converging. There's not going to be six foot social distancing on the convergence of a rebound <laughs> in basketball. And, you know, even if your ACH is four or five or six or seven, you're going to get people right next to each other, um, multiple points of the game. And so if we're going to green light that, um, I, I feel like we're starting to get to a point where uh, with the decision to potentially green light hockey with sub four ACH is, is about in the same ballpark. And so, um, those are just my, 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 my two thoughts on, on that in terms of process, in terms of how we make these decisions. So I, I, I told Ms. Dancer earlier that I would come back to her before, but I do, so I apologize. So I see Ms. Dancer, okay. Ms. Penny, then Mr. Harrington, and then Ms. Spitzer. Okay. Um, two things. One is just to say, uh, because I have two grandsons who play hockey, and they've been playing hockey since the fall, and... I'm um, not aware of any difficulties that they've had either before the changes in in the middle of October or since. Um, so I I would approve playing boys hockey. The other thing is I have a question. We already approved girls hockey. So now how can we turn around and say boys can't play hockey, but the girls can? They're going to be traveling way more and encountering way more different people in Hamden County. They're gonna be always in Hamden County. If anybody's concerned about Hamden County, they're gonna be playing with kids from eight other schools and they're gonna be traveling all over the state. Our kids playing here are not gonna be doing that. So I don't know how we reconcile that. Dr. Morris. I just want to respond to the process part of Ms. Stancer's comment, which is the recommendation we're making is would be for the school committee to reconsider the prior vote uh, for girls hockey, given the updated information and the the recommendation from the Amherst Health Director, which we didn't have last time. Um, okay. That's for your consideration, but I think I want to acknowledge and approve and just support your point that I think it should be the same or considered similarly for boys and girls. Um, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I should have been more clear with that earlier. My apologies. Okay. Thank you, because that was not said. Yep, you're 100% right. Ms. Kenny. Um, so one of my concerns was exactly what Ms. Stanzer said, that we had already approved for girls to play ice hockey. Therefore, it felt wildly unfair to say that boys cannot play ice hockey or the Amherst team can't play ice hockey. Um, I, I feel like I'm going to say the same thing I said in the fall. Our students have lost so many things and after speaking you know my my daughter played um volleyball this fall and those were her best days um you know the what sports bring to our students as the connection and the community and the team and an opportunity for them to see people that are not in their house with them all the time um and i think those are really important things that also need to be considered like the mental health and the physical well-being um you know for a lot of our students the sports is where they find those um, and I think um, there were also um, some of the public comments that mentioned that where we're already having a divide between the have mores and the have less, this is going to be one more place where that is going to be happening. So where our school can help provide outlets for more students to be able to access things for sports, the kids who can't afford to go to the club teams or the private whatevers, there's going to be more disparity that's just going to continue forward, right? So if I can only afford to play ice hockey through the school this year,
but my counterparts can afford to go to the club teams, they're going to continue to get better and have the opportunity for future scholarships or whatever that may be. So I think why I appreciate and understand and I really do appreciate the health director being a part of all of this decision making I think we have to think about our students mental well-being as all it, uh, in addition so um, I would clearly be in favor of voting for all sports to be played but if it's I also appreciate Mr. Demling's recommendation if we just hold off on hockey if people are having more feelings about that and to have the health director come talk to us. Um, but otherwise, I, I think we should have as many opportunities for our children to play sports as possible. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, so I, I generally try to wear one hat at a time, but I'm just gonna go ahead and clear the hat rack on this one. So, so as a basketball coach, like one of, one of my concerns here would be, let, let's just say for some reason, we lack the ability to have a season, right? Is there like a contingency? Like, are, are we thinking about, I don't know, having practices like we did with the football team, running like skills clinics for these these players? Because I know there are, are skills clinics in the area, these sorts of things for younger players, but it seems like the cutoff is right at high school. So I'm kind of wondering about that. And then the, the, uh, the facilities, the engineering nerd side of me, I guess, I, I kind of wonder, um, did, did you get any kind of indication from the, the folks at the rank, the facilities folks, as to whether or not they're, they're trying to work on increasing, you know, the, the air changes per hour or bring in some sort of a supplementary system, like kind of, kind of like a supplemental system, kind of like what has been talked about at the, uh, at the, the gym in the high school? Those are my two. I can do the first one, Victoria, and then you can okay. take the second one if that's okay. So in terms of the first one, we're recommending a season of basketball. You know, if for some reason that wasn't to take place, the school committee was to vote against it. Uh, I would have an interest in, you know, given that the health director at the current time has recommended um, or supported the recommendation to have that, that we do some level of intramurals. But the the, the recommendation that, that the administration is making based on the health director um, would be to have basketball. Um, as a season. Um, and you're absolutely right uh, in terms of where all the recreational opportunities, they absolutely cut off after eighth grade. I actually had a conversation today with, uh, or communication, I should say, with LSSC uh, or Amherst Recreation, I believe it's now being called, um, uh, about that, uh, about where their age limits go with their, you know, some programming they're trying to plan for in the winter. Um, so I think you're spot on, but I'll, I'll, I'll defer the second question because I know Victoria um, was directly in contact with the rink about that topic. Yeah, I don't see them improving that. Um, however, uh, I don't know. I don't think, I think a lot of these places that aren't going to require that, like schools also aren't going to have the same uh, air changes per hour, right? So we have to keep that in mind. They can still run that rink. It's not like it's a rink that should get shut down because they don't have four air changes per hour, um, similar to other schools that we could potentially, well, we wouldn't play at if they have less than four. I hope that answers. Um, uh, Mr. Sullivan, you haven't spoken yet, and then Ms. Spitzer. For anyone that's never been to the Moyens Collins Arena in Greenfield, just picture an old school hockey rink where it never gets, the temperature never gets over about 60. That would be hot. It is just one of those really cool old rinks, like an old state rink. And it, it's, you know, so I don't think they could get any more air exchanges out of it. But I, I personally believe that it's a parent's choice whether they let their child play hockey or not, not ours. Ms. Spitzer? So um, I'm curious about the timing of things since Mr. Demling brought up the process of delaying things. So if January 4th is the start date, is that the start of practices? Is that the start of um, competition? Or I know we're not doing full-blown tournaments, but is that when the bubble competitions would start? Practices, yeah. Okay, so if we were to delay a decision, it wouldn't actually um, delay practice for kids right now. Is that correct? 
with, yeah. the, with the exception of the girls' sport, the girls' hockey, which I think starts on the 14th, if I'm... The 14th, yeah. Okay, yeah. that would be a day delay then if the with the decision on the 15th, because the practice wouldn't start on the four, until the 14th at the earliest? Is that what the new... Yeah, so the they'll be two days they would miss a practice, essentially. Okay. And then just a final two kind of thoughts is... Um, um, you know, we're talking about the sports, and and I and I I hear what everybody's saying about the really strong importance that sports play in folks' mental health. I know that my mental health is a lot better when I've exercised, and I don't want to you know take that away from any kids. I'm just wondering, it are there creative ways we can um, start opening up opportunities so maybe the kids who were going to play hockey might be able to enroll. Um, in alpine skiing or the kids who don't actually play varsity sports, maybe they could join a, a, I know this isn't under your purview, but it would just be really nice if we could, going on Mr. Harrington's point, think about other ways to increase the number of intramural options for all of our kids. Because I think it's, I just really agree with the point that exercise and mental health are tied and we should be encouraging it, even if we can't encourage it in the ways that we have in the past. Ms. Kenny, and then I saw also Mr. Demling's hand. Uh, my question is just about the girls hockey. We've already voted yes on that. So if we delay this vote until the 15th, they get a day, right? That vote has already happened. Therefore, it, they, they're in, right? So then we would be going and taking away their season from them after they've started. That was more articulately raising the concern that I was trying to raise a minute ago about the timing and the potential conflict for student athletes. Mr. Denley? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so on the girls hockey, so I was gonna make that point about the sequence on, on the girls. The other factor with the girls hockey um, is that we're talking about, what is it? Is it two, two or maybe three, two or three students? So I, you three. Um, so if the concern is increased community spread, um, it's, it's obviously less of an issue with an order of magnitude number of athletes, right? When you're talking about two or three people. Um, so I, regardless of, of what the, how this conversation ends this week or, or next meeting, I, I have a pretty hard time just, and I'm open to changing my mind, but right now as, as, as it sort of feels, I have a pretty hard time putting up the, the participation of, of three individuals in, in, in a pretty wide open activity um, and, and, and calling that a, a, a concern about community spread. Um, you know, as terms of the question about like, you know, can we get alternatives for, you know, if, if some of these things don't happen? I mean, I mean, absolutely, we should be exploring all these alternatives. Um, the thing, the thing that, that's impacting my decision making here is that I, I look at this ultimately not based on principle, but of, of like, should students be playing hockey or not? I look at it in terms of pragmatism through through that lens, which came through public comments. Some other people said it is this evening, which is, should students be playing high school hockey or club hockey? And um, and, and and even even if you just look at through a strictly Fauci minimized community spread lens, right? Our decision to not have high school hockey. May may not have that much of an impact on on community spread or on you know on on risk of virus because is because we're not telling these students that they can't play hockey because they a lot of them will be playing it anyway, um, so uh, that you know that 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 alters my, my my thinking there as well. I I was gonna build on that and I appreciate that sort of pragmatic thinking as you as you sort of coined it mr demling and and just for full disclosure yes my son plays hockey he's an eighth grader and we were um, to understand that there's no jv um sports so he's not impacted by our decision at um other than the fact that there's club teams that are continuing now because there's no jv hockey so he is he's already impacted by that but um the i, I think you know a couple of things important uh, because it's been on my mind too, in terms of the the equity aspect, there are there are student athletes that don't have the opportunity to play club sports. They they their sports outlet um, and their family sports outlet is is through the high school sports um, or through recreation sports. And once you're in high school, your LSSE options are 
slim to none. Um, so by taking away high school sports of any of any sport, we're taking away that option for students that don't have the means or or just the physical logistic capacity to be able to drive and support their kids um, or multiple kids attending and participating in multiple club sports. Um, so that's a, that would be a conscious decision on our part because you're absolutely right, Mr. Demling, that the students, the athletes that are able to participate in club sports will absolutely be continuing to play at um, those club sports. And they'll be, as Ms. Stancer stated earlier, they're going to be playing in the same ranks that we're saying don't meet the, our standards, but they're also going to be traveling all over the state. And not my kids' team, but there are others that are going outside of state also for to play games um, or bringing um, teams inside, even with the new restrictions, right? So I think, you know, do we, when, I, mean, I feel like we should be asking ourselves, what are we trying to achieve by not offering one particular sport? Because as Mr. Deming pointed out, we're not going to be impacting potential community spread because it's going to happen um, with the kids of means continuing to play these sports, um, but all over the state. And, and also we don't have in-person school. We're, we're still in all remote school. And even if we were, you know, knock wood, fortunate enough to get our high school kids back into some hybrid learning, it's one day a week. So school districts that have canceled all sports like Connecticut, they're doing that to protect their in-person schooling and their students attending school and to be able to keep their schools open for kids to attend classes in person. We don't have that. So we, we're, we're purposely or consciously going to be taking away an in-person activity that frankly might be safer because it's going to be limited to a Pioneer Valley League as opposed to statewide um, and in exchange for no impact on our local community spread or the health and safety of our of our students because they're going to be participating in that anyway. Um, so I just I just think that's really important for us to really think about and reflect on why are why would we be making that decision and what impact are we hoping to achieve or what outcome are we trying to achieve by skipping and canceling a sport? And the other one, and I hate to say this because again, full disclosure, I have a swimmer. He hasn't decided what he wants to do from, from high school swim team, um, but I know that his friends are very excited that MIA voted for swimming. But at the same time, it's, hockey would be the only sport where we'd be canceling a season altogether. And because football, we didn't have a fall season, but we at least pushed it to the shoulder season. We know that many of the other, you know, the leagues are doing that. So do we really want to be in a position that we're singling out a single sport um, for, for non-high school competition and non-high school interactions. Um, and practically speaking, I, I don't know that it would be even practical to, to move it into, um, into that shoulder season. I know that there is football and, and hockey overlap. There's also hockey and lacrosse overlap. That's a different season, but I don't know. I, I don't know that even pushing hockey to a shoulder season is a, is a feasible opportunity. So I, I find it really, and I'm not going to advocate that, well, if we can't have hockey, we shouldn't do any sports, but I, I do want us to, to be thinking about sort of what are we saying and what is our statement by um, canceling one whole sport um, for that is going to be happening no matter what we decide in, in this, in our committee. Um, so for that reason, I, I almost would say um, I really like the idea of having um, continuing this discussion again um, in two weeks with with the health director um, and maybe some additional information about sort of what other school districts are doing um, and then actually tabling the vote on all of the sports until that time and not I because I, I honestly I would really hate for us to be singling out a, a, a sport um, at that point so if if folks are okay with that, that would be my recommendation. Sorry, I blabbed for a long time. I apologize. <laughs> Ms. Stancer? I would support that recommendation and um, would hope that we could have more information. Um, 
from the health director about about recent um, COVID infections. Ms. Kenny. Okay, you'd think I'd be able to turn the mic back on by this point, but apparently not well. Um, the other thing I wanted uh, you you brought to mind that sports are voluntary. There, this is not a requirement. This is not something children or families have to participate in. This is something if you choose to do this, you can. Right. So, I I have a hard time with taking away options from people where they're not required right like this isn't this isn't something oh you are in 10th grade now you have to play basketball after school it's that's not how it works like if you want to participate in this it is a choice for you so taking away choices from families and students i i have a hard time with that Are there other um, comments or thoughts? So um, I'm sort of sensing, I think we're um, aligned on sort of pushing this to our next meeting and not voting today. And seeing and inviting um, Ms. Dragon to join us to share her, her findings. Um, if we have an update on facilities, if, um, uh, if, if you want to handle that or if Mr. Roy Clark would like to join us, that's welcome to it as well. Mr. Dr. Morris. So um, I think the only concern about waiting, I want Ms. Stewart to jump in on that, but particularly as it relates to the pool um, mm. is, you know, we, we might need we can't just turn on the pool. Um, as Ms. Stewart said, it's a couple week process. I think it's gonna be tight to get done to be very blunt, you know, in time for early January. So I think, you know, I wanna just at least check in so that I, that Ms. Stewart can give a directive uh, or we can give directives to the facilities department to start working on that because um, that's one that is gonna be a hard one to, to do. So, I mean, I, let me put it differently. Is anyone opposed to us starting the process to filling the pool? Because there's, a, as Ms. Stewart said, there's a cost involved, there's labor, there's uh, resources. And I think if we're waiting two weeks, then we're essentially pushing a, a season that's already being pretty short and making it almost, you know, I'm just concerned it, wouldn't, it, it would get to the point of not being worth it, quote unquote. And I don't mean worth it in terms of the value of swimming, just it just wouldn't be enough weeks. Ms. Stewart, I don't know. I want to check with you to see if, you agree with that, and if you don't, it's okay to say in public we're good. Um, and if there are other sports like that that a delay would 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 cascade some challenges. No, I I agree with that. Yeah. Miss Spitzer, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just had a question because of the cost um, issue with the pool. Um, I know it's been. I don't know if subsidized is the right word, but it's been a source of revenue for the school because we've rented it out to other um, swim teams and I know the community uses the pool as well. Um, would those revenue streams be available to help cover the cost of filling the pool, even say maybe even the end of the spring when we're not competing? I, I'm just wondering if there's been any thought to how we're gonna help cover that cost, given that the budget is such a, Tough, tough one this year and next year. Yeah, so we have had conversations that I think at this point this down, the town, which is the, one of the primary um, users of it in terms of LSSC or Amherst Recreation. Sorry, I got to start getting that right. Um, I think they're still weighing, think, considering the comfort, their comfort level of renting the space out and for us to rent it out to other clubs. You know, I think they, they what I heard was a, a higher comfort level of having our team with our coach uh, who there's some stakes to following the rules um, um, more than opening it up more to the general public or to other clubs and, and teams. So that decision is not fully made, but I, 
I think it's the right question to ask. We've asked that question, and right now uh, the answer is uncertain. Mr. Sullivan. Having grown up on the ocean south of Boston, oh, you turn, turn that spigot on now. Otherwise, that water is going to stay cold until next summer, and you're going to have icebergs floating there. <laughs> You've got to get that water in there now and give it a chance to warm up at least a little bit. You swim faster in cold water, though. <laughs> I will say the, the shortage of um, available pool space and time um, and pool space with starting blocks is, is such that if, if there was comfort level, I know that there would be high demand. Um, the, the club teams are scrambling and scrunching for space. Um, so do, do we, Ms. Stewart. I just want to clarify. So girls hockey is fine to go that first day then. Okay. What, um, what more do we need at, uh, to, um, uh, to fill the pool? Do you, do we a head nod or? <laughs> I think that's good enough. I just wanted to at least raise the issue. So if the committee wanted to be swayed to on the swimming, partic particularly on swimming, that they had an opportunity. I didn't, you know, but just because even if you're waiting to vote, by not voting tonight on swimming, you're essentially voting tonight on swimming. Otherwise, we're going to have a pool filled with water and no kids in it. And that doesn't, that's not a good use of resources right now, if that's what we're choosing to do. Ms. Dancer. Um, about the pool, how often do we empty and then refill the pool? I mean, is this something that happens every year or was this done in, for a special reason? And so the water that goes in now would be there presumably next summer, next fall? Or would you empty it again and fill it again? Stuart, do you have clarity on that one? That's a little beyond I my knowledge. Know that answer. I have no idea about that answer. I could totally figure that out for you though and send you an email. I know it's been, it was drained in this particular instance uh, because the pool was closed and all our buildings were closed and we didn't want stagnant water in buildings that were gonna be closed for a long period of time. So I know that, I know that part of the answer. What I don't know is the answer to your broader question of how often the pool gets drained in general. Yeah. Mr. Demling. I just want to mention quickly in process, um, you know, like I, I'm, I'm comfortable waiting in two weeks. I didn't mean to say that, you know, this is, this is what we have to do. You know, if people are, want to vote tonight, people are, feel free to do what they want to do, right? I mean, <laughs> I was just, I was just throwing it out there as a process option if people are feeling like, like they're, uh, they needed more information in order to come to a decision point, so. Right as we get to closure, Ms. McDonald. <laughs> Let's just open it back up again. Ms. Kenny. Oh, I was deciding if I was going to say something, but I I'm comfortable voting tonight if that is a way we want to go, or if people feel like they would like to wait till two weeks from now. Um, but the head nod to the swimming to say fill the pool sounds a little bit like a vote without voting. Ms. Seeger. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm personally feeling really mixed on this and, and personally not qualified to fully understand the ramifications of all of this. What I really feel uncomfortable with is having making a decision after the girls hockey team starts practicing. That feels really uncomfortable to me that if we do come back and we say no, they've had one day of practice, they've probably amassed gear. Um, that, that just feels awkward to me. Um, while at the same time, like, you know, I, I don't, know sort of the right path forward. I'm truly in support of the kids playing sports. Um, however, if there is a COVID cluster because of it, that's gonna feel awful too. So uh, personally, I'm pretty mixed. Dr. Morris? Um, we could also come back a week from tonight if we're not doing an Amherst school committee meeting on the 8th, and that would be before the girls season would start. Um, I can check with Ms. Dragon to make sure she's available, but that might address Ms. Seeger's concern. I mean, it depends on what the group thinks, but, um, you know. 
What do folks think about that suggestion? <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs up, Ms. Spitzer. Thumbs up. Okay. Um, so we will hold and we will, instead of meeting on the 15th, we will meet on the 8th. Um, and we'll just move those topics up. Of course, now, with, I guess it'll still be TBD on the MOA vote. Um, now that we <laughs> move that up one week. Um, uh, and we'll see if we can get Ms. Dragon to join us next week. Any other final thoughts or comments? No? Um, I don't, I don't want to call you out, Ms. Gribko, but I, you've been, been quiet. I don't know if you want to add anything from a student perspective on this. Um, I don't really play sports, so I don't have anything to say about this. Thanks. Okay, so we will um, move on um, to our next item, uh, which is our JLMSC update. Um, so coming back to that, um, uh, and Mr. Harrington or Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I'll go ahead and roll with it. So, um, yeah, we, we met as a complete body, not last Friday, the Friday before. And so, so there have been some significant changes, I guess, to the format. So, um, we still meet for the full 45 minutes. It's just the first 20 is a, is, is somewhat of a closed session, a private session just in case we, we bring up topics that, you know, involve specifics that we wouldn't necessarily want to make public, like regarding personnel mostly. But, and then um, then we have the, the 25 minutes of public meeting. And also I, I realized I, I half said something wrong earlier. I said that the public has the, the opportunity to observe. For those 25 minutes, they have the opportunity to observe. And then afterwards, they have the ability to, um, via YouTube, make comments and ask questions that that sort of way. I think those are the probably the most significant changes currently. Is there, am I missing anything, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Moore, Dr. Morris, how are you guys? Now, the, the last time I had to sit out that first 25 minutes, which worked out because I had to reboot my computer so that the audio worked, but am I still shut out of that first 25 minutes or am I allowed to join that? I believe you're allowed to, <laughs> you can be there too, I believe, yes. And my, my other question is, they were asking about rooms, classrooms in the high school that were not even, we're not even in the high school. I mean, there's a few people, but uh, my, it was my understanding that the only classrooms in any building that are being used by students, staff, or administration are those that have met the four exchanges or more. Is that true? I could answer that one, which is, um, you know, the 13 students that we uh, have in distance learning at the high school, as you note, are all in classrooms that were in phase one. So they were tested long ago for the um, for that. So anytime there's a, a student working in a classroom with an adult, um, you know, and you might say, oh, it's only 13 students, but they're spread out among many, many classrooms, um, but they're all in the, the phase one already been tested. We'll have phase three results soon, but I think to, I think to the point, I think that was implied, we won't have phase three of students isn't happening anytime soon. I, I, maybe I, if I misread you, Mr. Sullivan, I apologize, but I think that's what you were getting at. That's exactly what I was getting at. Okay. Ms. Seeger. Back when um, we were asking the APA to renegotiate and to come to the table and talk to us, there were some issues brought up there that I don't think were fully ever clarified, um, some concerns about not meeting the contract or the MOA. And I'm just wondering if those have been brought to the JLMSC and if any of those have been resolved um, or I don't know, maybe Dr. Morris, if you've heard of something and if anyone can speak to that. I'll let Mr. Harrington start and I can jump in. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of a 
I don't I don't want to give a cloudy answer, but but um a lot of what we talk about in the in the meetings are issues with things that, that are, are kind of encompassed in the MOA and, and that's kind of the function of the JLMSC anyway. So so yet there, there there have been issues brought up and there have been resolved issues as well. And I'm not, I won't speak to whether all of them <laughs> were resolved. Yeah, that, that's about how it's it's worked out so far. Yeah, and I think even just to Mr. Sullivan's point earlier about phase three rooms, which we'll have some data on, I think it's just the concern of some teachers working from the buildings, they would wanna have that information even if students aren't in them. So we're trying to get that as soon as we can. Um, but you know, I think that's the productive part of, um, of the conversations as Mr. Harrington indicated. Any other questions for our JLMSC reps? No? Okay. Um, would somebody like to make a motion? Move to adjourn the Amherst Regional School Committee meeting. Second. Move by Spitzer, second by Stancer. And we will have no discussion and move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? No discussion. <laughs> right? Isn't that? Yeah, it is. I'm just teasing. Uh, going on. <laughs> Mr. Harrington? Harrington, I. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, I. Ms. Lord? Lord, I. Ms. Seeger? Seeger, I. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, I. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, I. Mr. Sullivan? Sullivan I go hurricanes <laughs> and McDonald I and the motion passes uh, unanimously and we are adjourned.